Okay. Hola. What's up? Hey, what's up, Nick? Hey. So I, somebody said that people are talking shit about me in this space. Am I hearing that correctly? Yeah. No, that would be that would be incorrect. I mean, a little bit, but there's been a, a deep argument. <laughs> We're debating yeah, like the our, we're debating like the political influence of the Groypers outside of the internet. Ah, I see. The Groypers yeah. are very influential. Nick, I think you're getting the wrong information. The truth is, we were just trying to have a conversation about our, do the Groypers have as big of a reach as some people think they are. So it wasn't so much okay. about you, to be honest. Like, how much, I was like, talking how shit. Much are the Groypers actually able to affect politics in the real world. Outside? Well, hey, now, hang on. Who is talking shit? Hadar? Hadar? Oh, Hazoni. Yeah, that was me. What's <laughs> up, dude? Hazoni, hi. Yeah, you know it. You know, it was a Zionist plot to deplatform me. There it is, Zionist. So you're Jewish, I assume, right? Are you a dual citizen as well? <laughs> No, no, I'm just Israeli. I don't, I don't recognize my American citizenship. Ah, that's good. Are you related to Yoram Hazoni? Yeah, he's my father. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. In the flesh. You know, there was a really funny picture I saw the other day of your father Skyping in from Israel to American Moment. And all the American Moment fellows were gathered on the laptop to hear the dual citizen nationalist, as Scott calls him, uh, I don't know, and tell them about politics or something. Why doesn't your dad let me go to his conference, huh? What if I want to see Peter Thiel speak? I mean, you could see Peter Thiel speak if you weren't such a racist. I'm not racist. No, I, I, I actually listened to like about three hours of you talking, and I probably counted about six different jokes about the Holocaust. That was around the time when I realized eh, this guy's not a real alternative. So what, do you need a safe space? Do you want to make your own Twitter space and make it a safe space? Are you Snowflake? No, I think Holocaust jokes are funny. I just don't like anti-Semites. Well, what, which is it then? You just said I'm a racist because I made a bunch of Holocaust jokes. Now you say they're funny. So which is it? Well, it just depends how you say them. I mean, I could be wrong about you, but I don't think I am. Oh, really? So it just depends on... Okay. Well, well, you said, well, no, what do you say? What, what, well, first. you s- Cause what? what? But you say, are you an anti Semite or not? I don't have to decide for you, no. you decide for yourself. Well, you just called me one. What's going on with you? You're very confused. You're having a hard time I'm not, here. I'm not confused. It's a, it's a straight First question. You, if you say one, you're not. You tell I, me, well, are you? Well, I think you are, but if you say you're not, I'll believe you. Are you not? Okay. Well, I'm not. Do you believe me? Yeah, I do. That's simple. <laughs> this is the most insane okay. shit. I've ever heard. <laughs> this is great, that guys. Settled. Can we hug and kiss over this? Like, this is so funny. This is fantastic. I'm. I'm glad I'm I got, got to ask you. Settled. All right, Nick. You got one yeah. down. I'm sure there's plenty more who want wow. to step up. Nick is repairing uh, relations with the Jewish community. Every <laughs> single day. I love Jews. <laughs> I love Jews. Do you believe me? Yeah. Oh, I mean, I didn't get to ask you before. Yeah. <laughs> well, but you came in here, guns blazing. You're making Holocaust jokes. You're a racist anti-Semite. I guess it's that simple, right? <laughs> I guess it's that easy. I mean, with me, it is. Yeah. Wait, Hadar. If, if they, I take people. I take you people at their Jews, word. Would you believe? <laughs> no, probably not. But I only <laughs> watched three hours. I mean, I didn't watch all of his stuff. I cut a cut, cut a guy a break. Yeah, you should watch my stuff. It's, uh, you know, listen, I'm a, I'm a respecter. You know, Darren Beatty, fine Jewish American. Well, Nick, I got okay. a question. Fine. Nick, I got a question. What What is okay. up with this whole thought process behind you want women to, it to be like Afghanistan? You said this Here on, we go. no, you don't have to go anywhere. You can explain it to me. Like, I'm not trying to, you tell me, man, how does that make sense? Why don't we go to like the pre-civil rights America? Wasn't, isn't that close? Dude, to I explained it to you earlier. Me. Free civil rights America? Listen, dude. Women are goofy, okay? And they should have no authority. <laughs> wow. They should have no I mean, authority look, over men. When the man's men. right, he's right. Thank you. Thank you. See? And, you know, they just really have no business in politics. When the man's right, and, right. Um, he's right. right now. <laughs> honestly, and I was only saying, I was saying that partly to troll um uh what's her name emma watson or whatever i was saying that partly <laughs> to troll her sydney watson whatever and um 
and it worked. But yeah, I also do sort of strongly believe in uh, Taliban rule. It's like, wouldn't that be preferable? Like if the Taliban, well, I shouldn't say this because I'm under FBI investigation. So let's just. Let's just... <laughs> <laughs> Yo, let's just but, but Fuentes, well, what's, your, what's your take on Catherine the Great, though? Or Catherine Cleopatra? I don't know. I'm not a Russian history. Hey, Nick, did you fly buff. down to Dallas? Are you still on FBI watch list? Oh, you drove. I drove. I drove to Dallas. How was it? It sucked. Is that supposed to be a taunt? Or is that no, you just not a asking? taunt at all? I love driving across this country. I don't. I don't. Mall America. Strip Mall America. One after the other. Eating at McDonald's and fucking Freddy's the whole way. That's, I, that actually was, I don't mind that because I love burgers, but um, yeah, yeah, it's man, actually not fun. Tendies from Chicago all the way to Dallas. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, okay, so. Nick, do you ever, yeah, Nick, I, I thought Nick, everyone was talking Nick, shit. do you ever regret that you yeah. kind of fucked your political career by like making edgy jokes? I don't think I, well, I think I reject the premise of your question because my career is uh, surging actually. And I think everybody is going to be eating their hat um, in a matter of years. But uh, I think the whole concept of career is gay. Like, no offense, but when I look at D.C. people and they're all sucking each other off at think tanks and talking about things like common good originalism, like, if that were my career, no offense, I would kill myself. Yeah, look, man, fair enough. Just, but, uh, like, you can't get on a plane. So, you know. Yeah, that part sucks. But I'm a real patriot. And, you know, when you're a real patriot, you have to make real sacrifices and <laughs> but there's a pretty I'm just saying there's a pretty big ceiling and we were just talking about like, you know, your influence and we were saying like you've gotten a lot of kids, you know, based and we respect we respect that for sure. But like, no, actually, you were saying you said that you said the opposite. No, no, I was saying I don't think that Nick has particular influence out of the outside of the Internet for the specific reasons that we're just talking about, which is the fact that like I think we both know that's not true. Nate. I think we both know that's not true. The Groyper cast for better or shadow. for worse, that's not true. No, I, I literally said I think Nick's probably a better influence than Ben Shapiro on young men who might otherwise be conservative. So, I mean, this is like I, I, I think that there's the fact that kids are listening to you, like there's good things and bad things about it. But the fact that you have like said super edgy things means that there's like a pretty strong ceiling to what you can actually accomplish in politics. And, you know, is that something that you're like actually thinking about? Like the fact that like, your basic your career now is basically like you broadcasting from your basement like you can't get on an airplane you're definitely never going to be like accepted in actual politics like you created a pretty big ceiling for yourself that there's not really anything you can do about at this point see no i i disagree with that i disagree with that whole premise i think that we need boldness and um you know as far as ceilings go um, I don't I don't believe in ceilings because I always break them. I'm always rising up through them. Um, so I think that you just sort of have a limited maybe imagination about what's going to become possible within the next couple decades. Um, so, no, I, I don't see it that way. And, and honestly, you so know, what is it? Is it Nick for life. president? Is that the game? <laughs> well, I don't know if that's going to happen because there's, you know, non-white people who probably wouldn't vote for me. You know, there'll be more of them than there are of us. Yeah. So what do you think is going to become possible in the next couple of decades then? Well, I think the ascendancy of uh, real American reaction, you know, I think people are going to become more right wing. I think white identity is going to become bigger. And, um, you know, I think there's going to be a decisive shift in right wing politics where, you know, the old guard is going to have less and less power. You're kind of already seeing that. Like the writing is on the wall. The old guard is basically dead. I mean, they yeah, they're, that's true. institutionally they're still around, but it's not what it was, um, you know, six or seven years ago before Trump ran. So I think that, you know, looking at it now, we're still sort of in the ruins of the establishment. They're still casting a shadow, still have influence. But, um, you know, what we're doing and, and by the way, it's to me like I'm more interested in just being authentic and being me like. With a lot of you guys, you agree with me on certain things, but you can't say it, and you kind of have to live your whole life kind of like, yes, sir, no, sir, uh, sorry, sir, sorry, Mr. Goldstein. And, you know, me, I just <laughs> get online, and I just stunt. Goldstein is just the name. 
There it is. There it is. You're so yeah. yeah. What can you do? <laughs> the Jews just have so much power, man. My, you my can't issue is to struggle against them. My issue is like I think we have a lot of the same uh, philosophical influences. You're you like Buchanan. You like Francis. Um, I'm more interested, though, in the idea of, like, an encompassing American identity and the idea that there is, like, some form of trans transmissible uh, Anglo-American culture that we're kind of in a position now where even if we wanted to reverse the last 100 years of immigration or of family policies, it's just not plausible. So, like, I'm, my white identity is such a core aspect of the movement if, first of all, it's probably... Uh, not the way that many Americans think naturally. They just kind of are not in that vein. They're more in the vein of uh, like America as a nation or America as an idea. Um, so like wh what, what's your position, I guess, on the role of white identity politics? Because you're definitely a proponent of it. I think you, you even said it today, right? I'm not saying- Yeah, so I- it. No, no. Yeah. And I don't take it that way. I think that, um, you know, there's this new phenomenon where you've got these populist types who have cropped up recently and they're these sort of Trumpism without Trump, a lot of Claremont people, um, acolytes of like Josh Hawley and DeSantis and Tucker. And I, I hear this like, and I love Tucker, by the way, that's not a dig at him, but you know, it, this is all kind of, uh, bound up together. I hear a lot of people saying this, like, it's about class, not race. And uh, like there still is this tension to deny the reality of race. And my basic belief is that that will become untenable over time because race is essential. It's an essential part of a person. It's a biological fact. It's also a sociological. What phenomenon. is race? What, what, what is race? How do you define a race? A race would be like a, it's, it's sort of like, you know, how you it's like a taxonomy. You know, so when you have like species and all these kinds of things, it's like race um, and then there's sub races and local forms are beneath like um, homo sapien, I guess. So it's, it's and there's like a white race. Of, is, that, it's a tax is that a classification? Is there such a thing as a white race? Yes. OK. And, and surprise, who is in surprise. the white race? Is there such a thing as the Jewish people, Mr. Hazoni? Yeah, but they're not. It's not biological. So. It's yeah, a different it question. It absolutely yeah, it is. It's not. Like, this is where I disagree. E like, even even you, Mr. Fuentes, could become Jewish if you wanted. No, I even could. you. No. -uh. Yeah, you can. No. Uh, yeah. Would, you Are you, you're talking to somebody whose mother converted become, to Judaism. Become and they got the, you know, the Ashkenazi, all the different other types. Not according you to real Jews, you have to have a uh, Jewish like mother. You. It's descended through the uh, matriarchal well, dude, line. I won't, I won't yes, correct, I won't, you. I won't correct you on white identity, and you don't correct me on who is an, or isn't a Jew. How about that? Why don't you not tell me what to do? Why don't you? Can you for five seconds not tell the white man what to do, Mister Hazoni? I'm right. No, up. probably not. Probably not. It's Zionist supremacy. We're just, we're just better than you guys. There but it the, is. but the, there no, it but that's is. the but that's the real question. But that's yeah, the real that's question, why right? People have a problem with you guys. It's because of that attitude that you have, which we all know that you have. Um, um, look, let me let me let me come to the defense of Nick real quick, even though he's blocked me on Twitter. Um, which is that the Nick, people I'm attacking Nick, Nick, the pat the people the people <laughs> that are attacking Nick right now sound a lot like the left. That's all I'm going to say. The people uh, accusing him of being uh, a racist, accusing him of being an anti-Semite, sound a lot like what Antifa would say exactly about Nick. And so, so you guys need to uh, really I, think I, about... I, think no, about, I took think, back about, the anti-Semite thing because he said that he wasn't. I took it back. Brought it back. I took it back. Which is it? Let, let, me, let, me, let me finish this. Listen, you need to really think about why your talking points are exactly the same as what any Antifa heckler would come in and say. That's all I'm going to say. I don't know who you are, Yazoni, whatever the fuck your name is, but I'm just going to say that you need to recognize that your talking points are functional. Any Antifa heckler at a Walter or Shapiro or whatever fucking rally. So that's my piece. I'm out. You're right. Nobody I can just, ever be racist. Know. You can never call someone racist. racist. So, I just no. want to know if Nick thinks Italians are white. Uh, well, I don't think Italians are like Anglo. You know, I would never. I, I preserve my ethnic identity as an Italian. Uh, so, but but listen, this is anti-white. You're being anti-white because we as Europeans have to stick together. Okay, in the European race, 
is real. And, you know, when people say it's almost like you betray that you're arguing in bad faith when you say, like, well, what is white? The white race isn't real. It's like, of course, the white race is real. Of course, race is a biological fact. And of course, it's also even if it's not for the sake of argument that it is a phenomena in society, you know, that people identify as black or white, and that has importance and salience to them is sufficient to say that it is real. Um, in, in yeah, that is true. And so, but so, that but it true. also is biological. And the thing is, is that, you know, th- this is why, th- this is why I'm bringing this up, you know, as to whether or not race politics will be important or relevant in the future, it's really a question of whether race is real, because if race is real, then that tells us that, you know, and, and because of human nature, we're not going to be able to overcome this. You know, this idea that like race will stop being salient magically because half the blacks and some Hispanics are all going to vote GOP because they all work at an Amazon warehouse. Like uh, that magically is not going to eradicate like the kinds of passions we've seen in the past year with like George Floyd and the Waukesha terror attack and all this. Like if anything, politics is becoming more racialized and not less. And as the demographics change and whites become a minority, I think that is going to catalyze by by distinction a white identity. In other words, you know, whereas white people growing up in some places now, but historically everywhere, everybody was white. So how can you really it's like a fish swimming in water. Does a fish know that they're in water if that's all they ever know? In the same sense, how can a white identity form in an all white nation? As whites become a minority locally and, and globally in America, you know, they're going to start to say, hey, what's with these uh, other kids in the classroom? What's with these other parents? You know, what's with these other people at work and at school? And, you know, it, people are naturally just going to start to notice these things. And um, I think that uh, and this is just a consequence of race being real as they notice them. And, you know, tribalism reigns relevant back that is going to be a part of our politics. And- okay, 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 okay. But here, so like, I, I, I still don't buy the race thing, but I, I, I'm willing to accept it for the sake of the argument. So then what is racial politics to you? What, what is the political interest of so, so-called the white race? Well, it's like racial self-interest. It's like, you know, we can look at other examples of racial politics in America. Like what is black racial politics? We have BLM, you've got bail reform, prison reform, criminal justice nonsense. You've got, um, you know, all, all the, and even locally, there's different issues within like the big cities and things. But, okay, but how, do you, like, how do you do this dealing with the fact that like 50 percent of like American whites are like shit libs now? Yeah, I mean, that's that's relevant. But the thing is, is like when you look at Trump, 90 percent of the people that voted for Trump were white and implicitly like MAGA and all those things was really an expression of white identity on some sense. People just don't know it yet. Like liberals got that right. And so you're right. I mean, there are liberal whites, but the bulk of what forms the so-called conservative Republican thing in America is whites. And it's gradually becoming more and more explicit that like conservatism is about conserving, you know, the texture and the character of, of a white American society. That's like where the opposition to CRT comes from. Like even people like Matt Walsh and others are calling it out. I mean, the most Trump. non-whites in like American history voted for Trump in 2020. So like it's it's becoming well, less. So what was that? 12 percent of blacks and what, 30 uh, some percent of Hispanics? Yeah, it's like a, it's like a little right? more than a third of Hispanics, a little more than a third of an Asians. Like it's not an insignificant. Yeah, okay. And then you had but that I'm, Fox I'm, News exit. But, the, but hold on. Like but the, but the idea, the idea that white identity is becoming is coming now. to the yeah. foreground, I mean, like it's moving. This, in this, this, uh, wait, wait, like wait, it's wait, moving. Wait. It's moving away. It's becoming less white. Like conservatism in America, both as a movement as an and as an expression in like Republican Party politics, like it's literally becoming less white. It's not becoming more white. No, I think it's becoming more white because like Trump compare Trumpism to like what the GOP was before. Trumpism was so implicit. You know, when he would say things like illegals or rapists, someone's doing the raping done, and he said we should ban Muslims from America, and he called Haiti a shithole country. And, uh, you know, you could go down the list, like, even make America great again. Like, here's a great question. Well, when was America great? Uh, 30, 40 years ago? And, you know, what was America like 30 or 40 years ago? You know, people didn't think about it that far. I guess liberals said that. They're like, what, make America racist again? And it's literally like, uh, yeah, like, 
bring back, bring but, back. But but Nick, what, you you haven't really you haven't really answered the question. Like, what are the interests? What are the actual policy things? You know, you keep on saying white identity, white America. Okay, what are the actual things that you think they need? You haven't said even one thing. Well, hold on. Hang on here. All right. I'm elaborating on my point. I compared it to black racial politics. You said, what would that look like? I said, well, look like every other ethnic politics. Well, here's an example. Anti-CRT. That's like a perfect example. Like that is a white identity issue because what CRT really means is anti-white. I mean, let's just say that CRT, like all these other bullshit Fox News talking points, is just another one of these weasel words to obfuscate the truth. It's like when we say it's like critical race theory, cultural Marxism, cultural Marxism, try Jewish intellectual, you know, try that one on for size, Mr. Hazard. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's just, you can't help the fact that American intellectuals were not great until the Jews showed up, but you just can't help it. That's just a historical fact. That's just not true. Yeah, that's That's not really, buddy. I'm not, what do you, what do you want to do? You want to be a Rawlsian? You want to be a Rawlsian? The the founders, you know, had some good ideas that might be worth Hamilton was Jewish. Thank you. What? Are you kidding me right now? What? Are you yeah. serious, like Hadar? Are you actually that. saying? Anyways, let's get back to. Sorry, mm-hmm. Nick. What were you saying? Yeah. So no, but I wanted. I wanted to add something because I don't buy this whole shit that like race isn't real or whatever. Obviously, it is. Obviously, it's a factor. My issue is more that, uh, like, a couple things. First, our Christian heritage prevents race essentialism from ever being at the forefront of things. Uh, the second is that. Um, Hispanics are moving in a way similar to how other white groups have moved. Um, and this isn't like a ridiculous thing. Like if you read, uh, there's this book called white shift by Eric Kaufman. Uh, he talks about this a lot, how the voting patterns are shifting, how identity within four generations is shifting. Okay. So that's like some good sign going on there. Um, and then the last is that, um, like it, it, at the end of the day, the, the oligarchy, whatever we call the professional managerial class that has its tongs and everything in our society, um, it affects everyone in a certain negative way that I think that uh, limiting our politics to this type of racial essentialism is just not beneficial for. So that would be my criticism of it. But like one of the problems, uh, Nick, with, with your whole movement is that I was probably defending you the most up here of anyone. I was saying that uh, I'm not allergic to you. I'm not allergic to the Groyper movement. Um, I disagree with them on certain things, but I frequently respond to them and talk to them when I very easily like wouldn't, couldn't. Um, and you're like targeting, you're telling them to come and target me. Like you, you said, I'm talking shit about you in the space and stuff. I didn't target you. Um, I mean, you literally. You came like, in. You, you were you were swinging like, punches, Nate. Nick. You, you, Nick, you came in. You were swinging you know, punches, man. I this said, is a this is a this is a divergence. Said, hey, this is a, this shit? is not really like part of the conversation. The I mean the, the point. Said, no, but it is part of the point because if like the one person who's gonna come up here uh, and I heard somewhat some, defend you, someone said people are talking shit in the space. That doesn't mean every. Why is everyone such a baby here? All right, it's a funny tweet. I was very. I jumped in. I said, "Hey, who's talking shit?" And people I like, was hey, pretty funny. Shit. Yeah, no, and no, no. Okay, like, no. The broader, okay. the broader, no, the interesting chill. thing to, to debate, Nick, that I I just disagree with you about is like that a strictly like white identitarian politics just doesn't work in American politics in 2021. Like you and I, I mean, I, I assume you recognize that like a solid 50 percent plus, like Amer- like American whites are in by many metrics like the most liberal demographic in America now. Like if you want any kind of coherent conservative politics. A, organizing around white identity doesn't work because a significant portion of American whites are committed to a politics that is directly opposed to everything that any kind of conservative cares about. And B, like a winning political coalition has to draw on the conservatism of of non-white Americans. Like regardless of this, you know, questions of whether or not like it's a good thing, like you just can't like the idea that like conservatism is becoming more race conscious and more organized around white identity it's belied by the facts of what the actual 2020 GOP coalition looks like and it's belied by just demographic numbers about what whites in America believe by what non-whites in America believe and what like any sort of reasonable political strategy for right-wing politics in America would actually look like from from any from any metric like it's not, but they even yeah, like I the 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 all right can I, I want, I want Luca's answer a uh, question answer yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, well, first of all, to, I just wanted to add to that a little bit. Like, 
the Anglo-American tradition is transmissible. Uh, I'm an Italian. The majority of America are Germans. Traders. Get out. Uh, Get out. I'm just saying. Could never like, let you in in the first like, place. It's transmissible to an extent. Like, <laughs> like this isn't like this essentialism. I don't understand. Because, Long like, live the queen. Concede the fact. Yeah, it, even if you concede the fact um, that you know maybe it's only within the that whites, it's like at, super transmissible. That's still like pretty extensive. The fact that like almost everyone here with a type of white consciousness um is not like a founding stock anglo okay well that shows us that like race and ideas are separated from each other to such an extent that you can have some uh like you know some uh nuance there so i don't know what what do you think it's a false syllogism that this is this goes back to um who who made this argument someone i think scott knows i'm talking about like 15 years ago it was uh what's his name the one from heritage who wrote the paper about race and iq and he got fired uh, Rich I'm talking Wine. about Rich Wine. Yeah, Rich Wine did a book talk on this like 15 years ago, and someone made the same argument. And he said, you know, that's a false syllogism to say that, oh, well, some people like Italians or American ethnics were considered non-white or non-Anglo, but the, the Anglo ideas were transmissible to them. Therefore, Anglo ideas are transmissible to other people. I mean, where's the evidence of that? Because if you look at the polling on the issues, non-white people do not support the First Amendment, non-white people do not support the you know, original interpretation of the Constitution. I just don't know where that is. And a majority of them don't even vote for conservatism. What's more is like blacks. Neither there do is, white people, like, though, bro. There's, Wait a second, hang but you're on, changing, hang on, you're hang changing on. the goalposts. I'm not changing, changing the goalposts. Goal I was talking about white ethnics. And now I'm saying that Latinos You're talking are about the white transmissibility ethnics. of Anglo ideas, and I'm saying certainly— Yeah, they were transmissible to white ethnics. Yes, but they, so they far were. there's no evidence that they've been transmitted to non-whites. I said that you can't—I'm not Again, talking about that. I'm saying that Hispanics are becoming white. That's what I'm talking about. They're, they're not white, and they're not becoming white. You're saying like, well— They are becoming Like, we no, have data that they're over time becoming white. They're still brown, dude, and they're not white. <laughs> And but, some, but actually, a lot of them aren't. Like, some of them, some true. of them have you know white admixture, and you know some of them identify as white. But that doesn't that doesn't change the fact that Hispanics don't vote like white people. Hispanics don't believe the same things as white they're, people. They're voting more and more like white people. Okay, well, again, what was, the, what was the percentage in the last election? In Virginia, the third. Fox it got up polls that over fifty percent. It was it was a double digit direction. jump. It was a was. double digit jump in like four different states. Like there's, it depends on the region, but like, fill it like Georgia, Florida, and Texas all saw like twelve to fifteen percent jumps. Like what about a massive? Let me ask swing. you this. Let me ask you this. What about in Los Angeles? When you go to Los Angeles and you go into a mall and it's all fucking Mexican speaking Spanish to each other, do you feel like you're in a white country? Do you feel like you're in Nebraska? Do you feel the transmissibility of Anglo ideals I don't know, when dude. they're waving Mexican flags the at their fucking soccer games in Los Angeles? Hello? Yeah, no, Luca makes if a good point. York, dude. You, feel, you, were, you feel the no, same no, no. way. If you were in New you feel York the same way in New York after Ellis Island. Like. You know, yeah, people. if you were in New York in the 1870s, it would not also feel like America either. Yeah, but these things are even now, go down to Little Italy or right Chinatown, now. it does not feel like an American country. Well, that oh, that's a good point. But also, Sam Huntington makes this point in Who Are We? If you've all read this, you already know what I'm going to say. There's a big difference between the Hispanic immigration of the past 30 years and the immigration from Ellis Island because Mexico is connected Sam to Huntington's America. Sam Huntington's making the exact point I'm saying, dude. I'm saying his that race is, is not wrong. essential. His conclusions are wrong, but he argues aptly, which you, apparently you don't know what I'm talking about, that the Hispanic waves of immigration are different than the waves of ethnic immigration because they're all one, uh, they all speak the same language, they're all largely coming from similar countries, they're contiguous with the United States, they're ampersands because they travel to and from America frequently, and the volume of them is so much higher in such a short amount of time. So, in other words, which is why it's taking longer, but oh, it, that, it's doesn't taking mean, longer. that doesn't mean it's, it's take, not going to happen. Right. And well, how, the this is my issue, bro. Nick, you're right, you're right about the size of the immigration. The size of the immigration is definitely an issue. That's not, a, you're completely right about that. But the language thing, that's a little bit harder because language is not a biological category. I mean, what if what if it was a what much smaller number anything? of people? I'm saying what if it was a yeah, much, much smaller number of people? If it was a much smaller number of people. But it's not. Cultural enclaves and things like that. No, it's not. Yeah. It's about different people coming here. It's about non-white people coming here. And you could say like, well, them speaking Spanish and playing football and waving their fucking flags and being, you know, on average 15 IQ points lower than whites, 
Like that's not cultural, okay? That is, and culture proceeds from race as well. And I mean, everything besides well, actually, everything, everything besides IQ, IQ that you just said is <laughs> cultural, and it seems like the beef yeah, outside of IQ has cool. to do with immigration mm-hmm. rates, which like we all, at least everyone on here who's like on board with the kind of like broad right wing politics that we're interested in, like I just don't I, understand. We want to what, what we want to re- we want to reduce. Like, I want to reduce it, legal immigration this, rates for the precise reasons that you've pointed out. But I don't – it doesn't mean that I don't think Hispanics can assimilate in the exact same way that, like, Russian they whites, clearly can't. but they're Italian not. Yeah. What are they going to assimilate into? BLM, gay pride flags. Netflix. Okay, well, now you're There's taking nothing. issue with – Oh, now you're, you're taking issue with – You're taking the exact opposite. You're, taking issue with, you're, you're totally oh my God. changing. Oh, my fucking God. Now you're taking issue with the Whoa, native blasphemy. culture. Now you're taking issue with the native culture, which is an issue with American institutions, not with the specific people that you're pointing to. Like you're talking about assimilation what, what, let me ask you this. of the native what, culture what they're really, being assimilated into. What really is the game here? Because this is what you uh, DC types do is just sort of like, well, now, now you're moving in Gulf Coast. It's like, <laughs> well, that is a slur if I've heard one. We're talking, about, we're talking about is the salience, or I should say, the advent of white identity politics in America. And I said, well, here's why it's going to happen, because race is real socially and biologically. This can't be ignored. Tribalism won't be overcome. And politics is becoming more racialized for X, Y, and Z reason. And so this is why it's going to be there. And you guys come in with these kind of quips like, well, Anglo ideas are transmissible because a third of Hispanics they have because in the are. last election. I mean, like, you're and just like, Luca, you're just, let, 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 him finish. This, let him finish. It's like you're, you're missing – You're missing the forest for the trees here. It's like, I don't really care that more Hispanics are voting for Trump. Travel to California. You know, I don't really care that, like, you know, once again, oh, well, 50% of Hispanics voted for Youngkin. It's like, okay, well, a black guy just drove through a crowd of people in Wisconsin in retaliation for the Rittenhouse case. And now even on Daily Wire, they're using the word anti-white. Like, to, to miss what's going on right now, uh, well, that's what you're doing. You're missing what's going on right now. And a lot of these arguments I'm hearing coming from you guys, you know, it's this is apparently this is what Trumpism without Trump is going to be. This is what all these clever populists have in mind. It's it's sort of just like the new version of natural conservatives. It's like these Hispanics are natural conservatives. These Hispanics are going to become. Buddy, right. I just want to look, gonna, look, buddy, buddy, go ahead, look. Yeah. I, I, I just want to save America. I, do, I think that your version of politics is just completely disconnected from reality. You're not actually engaging with the conditions of the moment. Like, look, first of all, in terms of Trump, like the man was like constantly touting black unemployment rates and would take every second that he could to talk about how he wanted to raise legal immigration rates. So if you're like touting Trump as like the, the necessary, you know, the, the, the secret sauce in Trumpism, I think you're going to be sorely disappointed by what the guy was actually about. But but in terms you of don't know politics, what the guy was actually in, about. In terms, in terms of, in terms of, <laughs> in, in terms of actual politics, if you are going to insist on a conservative coalition that is strictly organized around white identity at the exclusion of other people that might be allies in our electoral, say that. Oh, I didn't say that. You're gonna, you're I'm, you're go, you, you are going to lose because that kind of politics is no longer viable in America. I'm sorry. You just look man, no longer. Maybe it was, maybe it would be maybe it would be politics. maybe it would be ideal if it were. But if you are running in a, 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 a political campaign, a political strategy around activating white identity as the organizing principle of your politics, you are going to lose. And this fundamentally, look, man, like that's what I, I respect. Did, I respect some of what you're doing. But this fundamentally is why I was saying earlier, I don't think you're a serious political operator because the kind of politics that you are advocating is disconnected from the reality of what America is in 2021. It's just not going to work. Well, and the reason is we're not kicking people out, insisting on kicking people out, insisting on kicking people out who are actually interested. Wait, in no one's talking reality. about kicking people out. You see, now you're just now you're just misrepresenting my position. You took what I said, which is, you know, white identity is the future. And then you turned it into white identity, the exclusion of non-white people who want to participate, which is not what I said. You I said want a, a politics organized around silly. white identity. But now exactly. you're going to tell me what wait, I'm Wait, wait, nay, nay, let him answer. Let him answer. So, so Nick, what is... Okay, so let's just clarify something very quickly. Do you want a politics that's centered around race foremost? Because that would answer, I think, Nate's question. No, that's not what I said. I didn't say a politics centered around race. I said that, and I didn't even, I didn't say as an advocate, I said that it's a reality that politics will become more racialized and whites 
will become more racialized. A white consciousness will be raised. It's as simple as that. And, you know, I thought I heard okay. somebody... I disagree with I just okay. disagree with that. Okay, well, that yeah, there you go. Difference on the... Well, can I, can I ask this? Because, you know, let's say, I don't know, for, since the Civil Rights Act or whatever, until maybe about 2013 or so, I think we could argue politics got less racialized in that time. And increasingly more in recent years, it's become more racialized. What do you think is the exact reason for that? Is It's not, I mean, obviously we were getting more diverse in a lot of those years. It can't be that necessarily. To me, it seems like it's an ideological thing that's been pushed by, you know, certain people, especially on a lot of these minority groups, and it's come up in recent years. Do you think by making America more race conscious, it would promote more stability, less uh, racial divisions and problems like that or more? It's not about promoting it. It's a fa- It's just a fact that it's occurring. I mean, this is something that it's not well, like I'm why, going out why, there. Though? Why do you think it's occurring? Well, can I there? answer a fucking question here? Is it just like the no, I want to know bang over here? So I already explained that. I already explained why race consciousness will raise. I said that earlier because race is real. Tribalism is immutable. And if you believe that race is real, then you know that it's not going to be eradicated by, you know, again, this Bannon strategy of, hey, we're all Amazon workers. Workers of the world unite. It's like fucking Marxism. Um, in any case, to, to get to the original point, which is about your know, racialization of politics in America being a consequence of you know, being pushed, it's being pushed by the government or I don't know, other actors, that's just not true. And there's actually been a long sort of line of politics being racialized since really like the civil rights movement, because then you get the Black Panthers and you get MLK Day and you get politics really has kind of always been racialized and it's getting more so now. I think probably... It has a lot to do with like Obama getting into office because Obama gets in, declares war on whites. He says, I'm going to destroy Christianity and I'm going to take your guns. And uh, and there's a war on Christmas and whites. And this is literally what it is. Whites were like, fuck you. Like this. (laughs) They didn't say this explicitly, but with Trump, that was like their answer. They're like, fuck you, Obama. We're saying Merry Christmas again. We're keeping our guns, you know, and, and we love God and all that. Make America great again. Make America great again. So Trump gets in and Trump activates the other side because what does the other side make it about? They say, oh, well, Trump is this uh, white supremacist. He said Charlottesville was good and blah, blah, blah. And and then he can't that catalyzes the and riles up the non-whites, you know, and he's getting chased out of the convention center when he does his rally in L.A. by Mexicans. And then you've got the, uh, you know, Curial thing and you've got the uh, the Muslim gold star family and you know, ginning up all this racial resentment. And so I'll say to your point, it is true that the media and other powers are exacerbating the racial grievances of non-whites for political benefit, but they didn't create those racial grievances. They're exploiting them. And that's an important distinction because the racial grievances are, are there and you couldn't create them. You couldn't exploit them if they weren't already there, but that's just it. You know, It didn't take the Democratic Party for blacks to distrust or resent white people. It didn't take the Democratic Party to make the Mexicans or, you know, the Muslims or all these other alienated people uh, to to feel resentful towards a white revanchist president, which is what Trump was. So that's my take on specifically why it's gotten so racial in the past few years. Um, You know, it's not hard to see that. Nick, Nick, Nick. You just said white identity is the future. What? Mm-hmm. So if you're not, if you're, if you're saying that you're not interested in a politics organized around white racial conscience or white identity, what does that mean? That white people will become more conscious of their race, and that race will become more salient in politics. So why is this complicated? I feel like this is very simple, but you know, but for some reason, like for you guys, it's very hard. I'm just, I mean, look, man, I'm, I'm genuinely in good faith asking. Like, it seems like you're saying the same thing, but you're saying that they're different. Like, how is what you're saying the different from a politics organized around white identity? Because, because the, the idea that it politics is organized in the sense that I'm talking about is just not true. It's got nothing to do with, you know, nobody's doing any organizing. Organizing implies, like, intentionality or, like, you know, it's, it's acting upon politics. <laughs> you don't think politics is organized? <laughs> See, now you're just now you're just deliberately not understanding what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the white consciousness of of the people in the country is raising. You're saying politics being organized or something. I mean, what does that even mean? Who's organized the politics? 
the parties, the media, who's going to organize the political consensus and based the on what? The conservative movement, the regime, like there's like a bunch. So of what you're really, factors. so yeah, what you're like, really What is asking, the defining principle? What it's like? What are the defining principles and the objectives of your political movement? Like to me, it seems now like that's it's a like, totally separate question. Now that's just a completely well, separate it's just, question. It's just, look, man, it's just, it's just they're different. Fine, look, that's man, how they listen, that's dude, dude listen, buddy, fine. listen, man, you know. These D.C. people, they, you guys are going to ruin what Trump did. Trump went out there and he said illegals are rapists and we're kicking all the Muslims out. And you guys got in here and made it about common good originalism and multiracial working but class I'm just populism. You a question, man. I, I'm, I'm not really, really, saying that. I'm no, really, I'm really, I'm genuinely just looking for an answer. Like, is your is to the what objective question? of What's the your political movement? Is the, I don't know how to say it. I'll say it another way. Do you want American conservatism to be primarily about advocating for the interests of white people? Um, I would rephrase the question, but I'll basically say yes. Okay, so and and I'm saying and so then th- then those are the terms you can argue about. I'm saying that version of conservatism is going to lose. Well, you're wrong because there are not because Trump won based on that. Trump came in. In a field of 16 of the top Republicans in the country, senators, governors, you know, other successful political people who are all advocating for the kind of stuff you're talking about, which is like inclusivity and the new American century. And Trump came in and said, you know what? We're saying Merry Christmas again. And Trump okay. crushed I, I just I, I – um, so, Nick, I agree with you, I guess, on the whole interest of white people part. I would just say they're like they're just simply – and you, you can say that I'm wrong on this because you've already argued it, but they're simply not limited to white people and they're expanding every single day to non-white people. So I don't know why we need to use the term uh, white to describe what we're talking about, because inevitably this is expanding. It's something that is deep in the American psyche. Uh, it's something that, you know, a, a simple affirmation of a nation oh. or an affirmation of all this other stuff. Uh, I mean, you, you can say like, oh, you're basically just advocating for white identity politics. Yes. And, and you're and you're basically. Yeah, yes. I, I just disagree. Uh, I disagree with you. Okay, I, I do have a question about this, though. Like, it, let's say in however many years, you know, we were talking decades earlier. Right. Do you expect people who, you know, would call themselves groypers or subscribe to your philosophy to run for office and win only in areas, you know, whether it's state race or a federal race or whatever, only in areas that are dominated by white people. Groypers are already in office. Or do you expect them? And groypers are running for office now and they'll run in the future and they're going to do well. Um, you know, like here's a good example, Dave Riley. Dave Riley ran in uh, for, this was a local office, so I know you guys would uh, turn your noses up at that. It's like and, a school board, right? Yeah, yeah. And then say, oh, you know, you'd be sort of condescending kind of towards it. But it's a, it's a small scale example of a guy who ran in northern Idaho. He lost by 100 votes, but he was getting standing ovations and great crowds talking about CRT and talking in more explicit terms than, you know, Tucker, than people like you guys. And um, that's just really? a good because example. I think we, no, I think you're mischaracterizing us. We agree with basically anyone that's forwarding a dissident right message nationally. You're not dissident. We just disagree. <laughs> yes, we are. No, you work for hey, news, man. Hey, man, don't, don't throw insults, news, man. man. If he wants to be a dissident, no, he gets like, to sorry. be a dissident. If you work for Newsmax, like, you're not a dissident. If you're an ISI this is, fellow, this is you're not a dissident. Can I go through everyone's Twitter bio oh. here? Like, no, seriously. that's bullshit. Yo, go through mine. Yo, that. roast me, please. Sure. Yeah, you're your Amazonian son. You're not a fucking dissident. Okay, I'll just tell you that. Oh, shit. Yeah. I'm a oh, dissident. Shit. Here we I'm go. on the federal no fly list. Well, you're you an ISI fellow. You, fly you fly work anymore. for Newsmax. You're a dissident if you, like, say fucking Holocaust. Jokes. I that's don't. This is dissident. such a dumb. Don't you ever use dumb. that word with so me again, Joe. Don't you ever use that word again with me. Stop. Can we stop like the dick measuring contest and back get back to like actually talking? Yeah, about after it? I won, but it's kind of fun though. After I won, yeah, we could get back, we could get back after I won the dick measuring <laughs> contest. Okay, tell me about the, like Spitz the little fire, though. who like won based on your version of politics in like rural Idaho. Say restate that because I the other guy jumped in there. Just t- tell me about like the ideal sort of um uh you know receptacle for white white identity politics in rural Idaho. Yeah, so like I said, that guy ran on a more explicit message and uh, and did really well there. And I think that, you know, it's not a stretch to say that people like Groypers are rapidly going to 
enter politics and you're going to find that they are viable. You know, and, and I say this because people like Marjorie Taylor Greene are in office, Paul Gosar is in office, like, and, and who are the most popular commentators like Tucker Carlson and, uh, you know, so. And none of these people fucking agree with you, dude. Like, this is my issue. Uh, I, don't, I don't know about dude. that. I don't know. They about... agree with us. Yeah, I don't know if that's really true. They agree with us more than they agree dude. with you. But you're claiming all these fucking people, like, we're not allowed to be fans. I think, I think you're not allowed to be fans of Trump. It's just You're not allowed to be a fan of Trump. How dare you? Your, your, your Groiper movement is not as expansive yes, as Yes, it is. We cast a shadow over everything that goes <laughs> on in this country. Wanna, wanna, we're like Project Yeah, Nathan. fine. But, Nick, you still haven't answered Nate's question. It's a good question. Even if... Even if you were completely right about everything that you said, Which right? Am. Let's say for the for the sake of argument that you're completely right. I am. How do you win outside of places that are 75% quote unquote white? Well, see, you know, again, I wanted to get back He's to He's not winning in places that are Oh, can I answer white. the question? But wait, wait, he, but he believes no. he can. So I want to hear what his plan is. Let me answer the question. So, you know, earlier I made the distinction because one, one of you guys said like, oh, you're talking about white identity, the exclusion of everybody else. I didn't say that. And I, I actually, when you said, well, what does white identity politics look like? I said, well, it looks like other ethnic interest politics. Is there a black nationalist party that only the black people? No, of course not. Blacks vote for Democrats because Democrats support the interests of black people. So do Hispanics because Democrats support the interests of ethnic interest of Hispanic people. The Republican Party must be the party that is going to, uh, you know, serve the interests of white people or advance the interests of white people, which happens to have overlap with broadly, you know, ideological conservatives. Like, yeah, a lot of Hispanics voted for Trump. And guess what? Trump was advocating, in my opinion, proto-white identity. And, and some blacks did, too. And so I don't think that it's about excluding anybody else. It's actually about including white people. And it's interesting because, you know, nobody really seems to have a problem with the ethnic interest politics of the aliens, it's always the native population when we, we start to talk about racism real and the transmissibility of ideas. It's like, what about our people? That was the message of Trumpism. You're our voice. And that's what the Republican Party has to be, is the voice of the disaffected white American. That's what conservatism is supposed to be, but what like the leadership is trying desperately to run away from. And that's why they're bending over backwards to appease and pander to minorities. And, uh, and if anything, that's the thing okay. But you're doing work. this like uh, all right, all right, thing. all right, like, all right. You're doing this. Richard I, I'm just gonna. I'm gonna. Like, like, the, like I'm Trump gonna Trump step in. No, no, no. I mean, wait, Luca, this, Luca, wait, I mean, Luca, me, Luca, shut up, really Luca. Quick, let, let someone else talk, Javon. Go. My okay, African American. No, dude, can you please? Can you please let someone else talk, Javon? Go ahead. Yeah. So I I don't know, Brand Flakes. I'm assuming your name is Nick. I've been hearing people call you Nick. Um, former white White House guy here, Trump White House guy here. Uh, black American, conservative black American. What's interesting to me is that your logic, the way that you've spelled out essentially how this future conservative movement will be is not necessarily that it's pro-white, it's that it's anti-minority. <laughs> of course uh, and you, you and would you say may, that. And you, no doubt I would hey, say let that. Let him finish I, the question. Yeah, no, no, no doubt I would say that because by your logic, you're saying that by nature of my skin color, I'm automatically a Democratic voter. I didn't say so that. I didn't say that, Candace yeah. Owens. No, this is stupid. Yeah, boo. Like, you guys boo. please fucking answer the question? Holy shit. No, no. But, right. my, I mean, he doesn't even know who he's, like, talking to. Like, he doesn't... He doesn't know. Just well, the question him. stands, uh, man. Yeah, I mean, but, Nick but said that minorities support Democrats. I mean, is that necessarily no, like, a point? I'm not, I'm not doing this whole, like, style. like, I'm not doing this whole, I'm black and I'm offended. Like, so let's go. Like, we're having a yeah. He didn't say he was offended. Shut up. He I only had a question. This is, no, it, it was yeah. like, it was one of those, like, not all arguments, which I'm, we're not interested in talking right? about. Right now. now, what we're talking about right now is, is the place of white identity in the conservative movement. We're not having these, like, grandstanding people coming up here complaining about like Nick, what Nick said. But, but Luca, that, said. but that is exactly the problem, right? Because Nate's oh, point okay. is if you want to win no, elections, you guys, if you want to win, your look, Nick's like ridiculous. Like it was Nate's, it was Nate's point human. was that if you want to win elections, you have to also care about people who are not white. Okay. And then this guy who's not white shows up. And the first thing you do is you laugh at him and chase him out. 
That's yeah, exactly his point. Him, that is the gayest YouTube. thing I've ever heard. Well, me, well, he doesn't even reason. fully know what we're talking about here. He doesn't <laughs> even know who the dead. speaker is. It's kind of irrelevant. Well, Andy was black. Let me let me just clarify. Let me just clarify here. My problem with the whole white identity thing is that it's just not materially true on the ground. The idea is that some things are transmissible. Uh, people do adopt the American nation, the inheritance of the American nation, the heroes of the American nation to through rhetoric, uh, automatically single out people uh, that fit that category. That's a lot of people. Like, and the, the fact is that Trump didn't do that because Trump doesn't believe that. Trump believes what I'm saying. He does not believe in this essentialism that you're saying. Hey, Luca, that's just not true. Hey, Luca, thanks for, not, Luca, th- like- hey, Luca, thanks for giving me the boot earlier. Number one, as a black oh. Trump supporter, fuck you for that oh, shit, dude. Go. I'm as conservative as it gets, so, like, fuck you for that, bro. (laughs) Number two, Nick, what I was trying to say is, once again, as the the token black guy up here, as Lucas so-called pointed out, what the fuck I was trying to say is, before I got booted, was that your vision of the party, your vision of the party, bro, doesn't include people like me. And not only does it not include people like me, it doesn't make an effort. It doesn't make an effort. Now, my question is, now, my question is, why is that attractive in a country that's becoming more and more diverse? Why would you want Okay. Don't you work for the America First Policy Institute? Bro, can you Just, please like, let him finish up. his fucking question, dude? Yeah, no, that's, that's a dumb point. Let the fuck up for finish. 30 seconds and let him finish his question. Before yeah, no, my, my point is... Regular uh, John Brown over there. Thank no, you my, for fighting. <laughs> my, my point is, my point is for, for folks, like, the country's obviously getting more diverse. And so, uh, frankly, white people are going to be a minority. So I'm just looking at the numbers game of this shit, dog. And it doesn't make sense for you to say, well, this should be a white-only party. Like, why does that make sense to you? Even if you're See, just but I didn't numbers. say that. I didn't say a whites only party. And like, again, you know, it seems like there's just like an understanding barrier here. It's really not even an argument or a debate. It's more like me sort of educating all of you. And Javon, I'll educate you, boy, about what I just said earlier, which is that Ooh, it's child, not about me, boy. <laughs> Damn right. It's not about. It's not... I'm sorry, brother. I'm sorry, brother. I didn't mean it like that. I just. Uh... You know, it's not because you're black. Just that's just something I say sometimes, brother. But so listen, what I said earlier is it's not about excluding non-white people. It's about including the base of the GOP, which is whites. Like, why is this difficult? Ann Coulter said this years. I don't like Ann Coulter, but she said this like decades ago. You need Dude, black Steve people are conservatives. Too. That's what you're not getting. Black people. Yeah, but they vote. For- yeah, but black oh, people. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, Wait, hold up. At this point, Devon, whatever your name is, he, he said he's he said he's not opposed to having non-white people support the GOP. <laughs> but then but then the question is, what are you willing to do to reach out to these people to get he's them to support not. you? I'm saying we shouldn't. That's what I'm confused about. Like black people are naturally conservative. So there's a demographic oh, there. The, the point the, the point is, is that the conservatives traditionally have not reached out to black folks, which is why Trump oh, had widespread right. success. I just want to point out two minority groups. I just want to point out, like, you worked in the Trump administration, and, like, that kind of says it all, doesn't it? About And, and by the way, you worked for the America First Policy Institute, which also says it all, <laughs> which also says it all. Like, this is yeah. who's at the, like, if that te- does not tell you what the fuck is wrong with Trumpism without Trump, it's basically like all the awful staffers who fucking wrecked the first term are now going to go on into new think tanks funded by the same people and promote reaching out to fucking black are you gonna are you gonna yeah. answer okay, the question you dude? are you gonna are you gonna go on a tirade about black chat. people are you gonna the question, the question? why what why we're not gonna try and win over blacks yeah, yeah here's here's the answer to your question conservative blacks don't even vote for republicans there's no correlation between what blacks believe and who they vote for it's entirely it's entirely based on their identity as blacks that they vote and for so that relationship Democrats. only exists with white people that white people vote for like you don't forget the I'm trying to understand your logic. So black people, there's no correlation between morals and who we vote for. That relationship only exists with white Americans, what you're saying, right? No, it only exists with black people. Only black people are like that. Okay. Conservative Hispanics vote for Republicans. Yeah, but for whatever reason, and then you can ask anybody to look at the polling yeah. data on this too, because you're right. There are, you know, blacks are somewhat conservative socially, yeah. but they don't vote for Republicans. And like Why just do you like think reaching that is? out thing. Oh, I, Wait, I Devon, let him answer about the reaching the blacks, out. Right? Nick, why shouldn't we reach yeah. out? Why shouldn't we reach out to minorities if we think they're somehow it's like... It's a waste of time. Why? It's a completely waste because right, it doesn't work. 
it doesn't work and it's not worth it. And we should try to win over white people like Trump did. Trump brought in the white working class from Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania and won. That's what carried his victory. Not the 7% of blacks that he won in 2016. Not the 20 whatever percent of Hispanics that he won in 16. He won by reaching out to a broader white base which the was problem not with based this on is this isn't going to work in 50 years, dude. This is yeah, the bro, problem. Bro, he won. He won by he won by, he won by, by like thousands of votes across three states. Like this is not this is just not a viable. Yeah, and Mitt Romney lost, and so did okay, John. Well, nobody here supports Mitt Romney or McCain. That's it. That's a straw man. Well. But, 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 well. but Nick, but so well. but answer the question: If the numbers are against us, if the numbers are against, are you fat? You sound fat. What? That's not the but point. The, the point is, is, if the numbers are against us, then how could you ever possibly win on a pop uh, based on a population which is quickly becoming a minority? You haven't that, answered that. That question. was my question earlier before I got the boot by Lucas. Well, That's Nate asked it, then I asked it, then you asked. It, now I'm asking it again. You, know, you keep saying, you keep saying, you keep saying, you haven't answered my question. It's like I'm fielding about a thousand questions, and I think I'm answering most of them. So how is this going to work in 50 years? Here's how this is going to work in 50 years. Okay. I believe this to be true. There are going to be non-white people that are going to join up with the conservative side. And once again, I'll reiterate, there are going to be non-white people, as there are now, who subscribe to a proto-white and eventually a white identity message or, or something that includes white identity. They will. So that will still be competitive. The other thing, though, is, and this is just true about you know what's going to happen within the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, is that conservative politics will not be viable. You know, this idea, because I, I hear what you guys are saying. You're saying like, oh, well, white people are diminishing. Um, you know, the, the percentage of whites is diminishing. So that's why we need to create this big tent thing based on Anglo ideas and propositional nation. And that's why we got to bring in Hispanics and blacks. And I'm telling well, you like, that what, what is, that's, what is, hang on, what hang on. Well, can I answer the question that this Jewish guy? Hey, man, about? Jews have really good questions. Really good. Yeah, we know. We know. Yeah, it's a real culture of critique going on over there among, among those guys. So anyway, so the, the point is, is that your politics is not going to be viable because these people are not going to vote for a conservative message. America is going to become a one party state under the Democrats. And the goal is going to be create a, a, a viable opposition and resistance to that. And the only viable resistance is going to come from white people. And yeah, there's going to be some Hispanics and maybe blacks in there too. But, you know, like I'll give you a good example. When we think about the future, I don't think honestly nationally, because I think that basically that's over. I don't think that, you know, we're going to flip Texas and all these other states back red in 20 years because we subscribe to economic nationalism. That's a fucking pipe dream. But here's what may happen is that, you know, maybe in these conservative parts of the country, like this stretch of land from Idaho to Florida, We'll be able to consolidate power in state governments. And, you know, as the federal government becomes weaker due to affirmative action and is maybe less able to project power, maybe there's more autonomy in these places. Maybe there's more Ron DeSantis's governing states from Idaho to Florida. And maybe we have something like, you know, a real federalism or something. And so I think that honestly, that's the only that's the only appropriate and reasonable way to think about politics. I mean, you say that white identity is not viable because we can't win a presidential election with only white people in 30 years. I think that is a ridiculous premise. And the idea that like you guys are still entertaining that shows how unserious you are about the gravity of what's going on. Talking about electoral politics in 15 years, that, that's not going to it's just not going to work. That's an anachronism in 15 years. You know what I'm saying? So we've got to start thinking bigger than that, which is. How can we consolidate people in America to oppose what's coming, you know, under under an umbrella that is strong? And I think that, you know, basing it on this uh, economic nationalism or, or transmissible Anglo ideals, I don't think that's going to hold together any meaningful opposition against the government. I do see, though, these Q boomers. I see these activated, you know, the Trump supporters, something that is based on the, you know, sort of white American Identity. I think that's the only thing that's going to bind people together to oppose what's going Wait coming. a second. No, what the Q boomers are doing is they're reasserting their Anglo-American values. That's what they're doing. They're not reasserting a racial value. What is exclusively racial about the Anglo-American tradition? 
It's something that's been transmissible. I'm not Dude, talking about the Anglo-American tradition. We're thinking about the uh, Anglo-American tradition. What, what yeah, you're, thank you. Is you're, about what you're doing it. is you're separating, uh, you're separating uh, people's concerns over the way the country's going with their heritage, which is Anglo-American. So when they're revolting against the way the country's going, they're not doing it for racial reasons. They're doing it because the country doesn't look, not racially, it doesn't hmm. look like it used to be. You can just talk hmm, to them. Yeah, why is that? Tell you that. Why, is, why doesn't it look the way that it used to? I think that's an interesting question. Maybe it's because well, all I mean, these fucking I mean, non-white yeah, immigrants poured in. That's a part of it, but it's also... Doi, like, also hello. Uh, another part of it is the fact Why that does Israel like, not look like changed. it used to? Yeah, because of non-white people pouring in. Like how, why, again, this seems like so simple to me, but um, for some reason this, like, we're really getting into the weeds about simple stuff. It's like, you know, when you look at, and I'll, I'll just keep saying it, when you look at Trumpism and why it succeeded, it was because it was a message that was based on culture and identity, not on economics, not on ideology. He didn't go there and Neither say- Neither of those you know, like, things are racial. Yeah, I think yeah. it's no, no, Nobody here, nobody hang here on, is- Hang on, hang on. Whoa, hang on. I, identity, I just think you're overemphasizing the racial aspect of it and overemphasizing the racial aspect. But race is been. extremely salient. And you, you guys like don't want to entertain it seemingly at all but race is a very salient part of of identity like to say that identity is not racial what a retarded statement that is sure it's to part say of that it. identity no, part of it. is not a it's not all thing. Of it. it like the yeah. pre- class is more important thanks man race. thanks for that and monolithic aspect yeah, real all brilliant is like sure. but on, on this point about america not looking like it used to i mean it's not again it's not just the racial part even when you go into the very like white parts like almost exclusively white parts of america like they're still seeing things in their communities that you know it doesn't look like it used to you know trans story hour or whatever their kids going into school and like half of the girls are identifying it with like weird it's actually ego worse pronouns. culturally it's worse in these white areas so this just doesn't make any sense the the factor here is that the culture is changing we don't identify with the nation anymore like we used to in academia. And this isn't a matter really of race, although, you know, race is something that has changed okay. over 50 years. Yeah, how about it's the past year of race riots? How about the past year of race riots? Those, those black people taking ATMs and tying them to their trucks and driving off with them, that's about fucking liberalism? Yeah, and the, and the fact that they but, don't... That was yeah. all sanctioned by, like, progressive white elites. Like, and the... White progressive elites. White, white, white progressive elites. White progressive elites. Remind you, white yeah, progressive but, token, but, the token White House. White here. progressive no, elites. But, yeah, it's, that, well, that is true. But but Nick, I mean, the the problem with what you're saying is, I mean, basically, that's not a vision that that can save a republic. You know, you're basically saying secession is coming. We don't have save anything to do Save the republic. Save the. How old are you, dude? Save the republic. What are you, eleven? The Republic is dead, okay? Uh, well, we fine. A giant well, they, that's... multiracial empire. And the idea that we even care about being a... Re... I, you know, if America was a kingdom under Donald Trump, I'd be fine with that. It's about saving our nation, not our republic. A republic, if you can keep it. How about our identity as a nation, if we can keep I, it? Can hey, keep I'm, it? All about, I'm all about that, but I think secession will destroy the American nation. If, if anything that's right. left of it. Changing, we're kind of changing the boundaries now. The, the fact is that, uh, you know, Nick is right about that. Nick is right that there Let's is go. a nation that uh, predates the uh, political order of America. And the political order doesn't really matter. But no, I, you're, you're not arguing against I'm a nationalist. Not, the nation, right, but the nation is not exclusively white. I mean, this is just Wait, like which a nation? problem. <laughs> what? Secession like, will destroy the nation. It just yeah, will. American Good. nationalism Good. is like inseparable from racialism. These things are not like combined very much. If you talk to any person out in the middle of nowhere in America, they're not racist and they're probably a nationalist. Yeah, they are. Hmm, dude, that's you've probably man. never even been in the country. Yes, they are racist. I 100%. Fucking, dude, I'm, I'm a fucking welder. I'm a fucking welder from outside Philly. All Luca of my Cacci friends Troy joke is around a welder. about race. <laughs> yeah, all my yeah Philadelphia is not racist. racist. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great argument. Yeah, neither is Boston either, right? They're not Chicago. Not yeah, but Nick, that's not a fair argument. I've been in 45 states. 
And I got to say, not the majority of people I met were not racist. Yeah, we know. You're at home everywhere and nowhere. Austin's a perfect example. They're like overtly, like, you could say they're like pretty, you know, racist or whatever, but they vote like overwhelmingly Democrat. Like, okay, but uh, that was the argument. I mean, you're like, well, they're racist, but they vote Democrat. It's like, no, well, but, the but, question? But, they're racist. No, but I, I actually disagree with you about the people in the middle of the country. Like in my experience, like having going going to these areas, they might have ideas about like. They, they have good instincts about like, well, I don't like that BLM stuff or whatever, but they're actually like really, they're actually like not racist. They actually, they, you know, they talk about like MLK and stuff and how I like that MLK, but I don't like that BLM. Stuff. <laughs> what, what country are you from, man? I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe when you meet When you them go to Trump like rallies, like, you know, in the middle yeah. of nowhere. Do you, do you not, spend a little bit of time, wait, spend a little bit of time with the majority people? of Americans. Do you think a majority of Americans? Do you like actually Francis think? Pill? Why do you? Why do you have such a condescending tone? Is it because I'm a goy? Why? You that why? To, you're telling is me it because I'm a goy? Tone, Nick, I just got to point out. Because Luca was defending you. Luke, Luca was the guy defending you before yeah, you showed up, and you have so alienated him. Good. Yeah, he's got a girly voice. I just don't like your personality. Your voice is girly. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because you sound like a pussy. Wait, wait, Nick, describe Luca's girly voice. Yeah, I think you're a bad. What specifically is girly about it? I don't know. Just like this high pitched, up talking tone. It's just like very effeminate. I, have you ever thought. touched a woman, bro? <laughs> no, I haven't. No, I no, no. You only become a race realist uh, if no one's willing to date you. Uh, yeah, all right, let's not let it like go. Sorry, dude. This, this, fucking, this like, is good turn you stuff. into a fucking cube and throw you. All right. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, good times. Well, did we resolve all of the important questions that we came here to debate? Yeah, I think yeah, I Nick, won. Nick's ideas easily. are good, but he's a bitch. Right, I'm going to kick you now. Oh, come on. Dude, did you, did you, did you really? Oh, did you kick him? Oh. Yes. Look, That's I mean. So yes. Wrong. What are we going to talk about now? Hey. Good evening. Yeah, let me back in that space. Let me back in that space right fucking now. Hey, they kicked me, guys. They kicked me from that space. What the what the hell was that? Give me a fist in solidarity. Give me a white fist emoji in solidarity with the white man. Let's go with the goy. Raise a white fist emoji if you stand in solidarity with the goyim. With a red-pilled goyim rising up in this country. Let's fucking go. Seeing a lot of fists. What was that about white identity not being viable? I see a lot of white clenched fists rose up. In solidarity with all the real goyim out there. Yeah, I don't know. I don't really want to do a whole space because I just got done doing one. It was a lot of fun, but uh, uh, yeah, they kicked me. What the heck is that? I guess the guy couldn't ha- handle the banter because I called his voice gay, which it is. I hate all these people that talk like girls, you know, like every question out of him. It was so like passive aggressive and feminine. I hate that. Like, and he starts out, he's like, thinks he's trying to be nice to me or whatever and then the whole thing he's just like a condescending effeminate girl and uh you know what and then by the end of it, he's like well i was being nice to you and now you're being mean to me you know these dc people are the worst these people from dc they fucking suck okay every one of these uh you know think tank people not well i shouldn't say all of them i know some of them some of them are okay But they're all like this. They're all just like these nebbish, like the most insufferable people. We know what's going on, okay? Trump won because he was racist. Let's just get that straight, okay? That was the one thing that um, I didn't get to clarify enough. Because they were like, oh, Trump disagrees with you. Trump won because he... He extended an arm to the the Negroes and to the, uh, the Mexicans. What?! Did you watch the same 2016 election? No, Trump won because he was a proto-racist. And absolutely Trump believes in race essentialism. Yeah, he didn't say it at the rallies. But, like, look at his tweets from 10 years ago when he said uh, the violent crimes in New York, 99% of them committed by blacks and Hispanics. Trump absolutely knows what's up. And he knew what was up when he was race baiting about Muslims, illegal immigrants, uh, and and, uh, law and order. I'm ready to go up there and say law and order and say these animals and all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. But he was just extending an open hand in friendship to the non-white racial insurgents in America. Give me a break. 
These people are delusional. Honestly, and that is what it is, is they are just delusional. They've got their heads so far up their asses in Washington, D.C., or their assorted think tanks or whatever. That's what happens. You spend too much time there. You talk to all the other. It's literally D.C. is full of women, Jews, gay people. Like, no offense, but that's what it is. Like, I'm not trying to say anything other than that's that's who comprises D.C. And so and it's and these student council president types you know, sort of low self-esteem, beta male, male feminist types, you know, and they all get in there and that's what happens. I mean, and I would say that they're probably even born like that. Like they're all born being sort of like minded about inclusiveness, inclusivity, niceness. You know, the guy called me like mean. He's like, you're being a jerk. You're a real asshole. I don't like your personality. This is such like a feminine thing to say. Could you imagine you're in a political debate and you say, you're being too coarse of me. Excuse me. This isn't very civil. But that's what happens when you grow up in debate club or whatever. That's what happens when you grow up in student council and, uh, you know, whatever. So, yeah, I mean, that, that whole crowd just doesn't get it. And this is what we're in jeopardy of. This is what the war is really about. It's like who will determine the future of the right wing in these institutions? Is it going to be Trump-like people? And by Trump-like, I mean real Americans, real human beings, real patriots, people that are probably racist and don't care and don't mind if you know, or is it going to be these like preening little intellectuals in D.C. who like totally did not understand what 2016 was about and are going on and on about the transmissibility, transmiss transmissible, transmissibility, transmissibility of Anglo value. Who's going to determine the future of the right wing? Is it going to be people that, you know, talk about being in touch with reality? Is it going to be people that live in uh, Claremont world and people that think that blacks are stealing ATMs because of liberalism and because of progressive white elites, uh, you know, propagandizing them to carjack five people every day in Chicago? Or is it going to be people that know what law and order, drugs, crime and rapists? And, you know, no Muslims entering the United States actually means, hello, it's very simple. So, and it just goes to show, like, you know, I have a sort of brash tone. I have, like, a brash personality. And, yeah, I didn't go to college. Um, but I'm a genius, and I'm smarter than these people, okay? I know that I don't, I don't have the podcast voice. I know that I don't have the podcast cadence, right, like that they all have when they're on American moment or whatever. I know that I don't sound like that, but, uh, but I am smarter than these people. And you see, when I get into a debate club with like 10 different, 10 of the most impressive, you know, uh, red alert politics, 30 under 30 can't hold the candle. Not, not 10 of them combined. You know, I step on them and that's just it. You know, a lot of these guys like Dave Reboy today, he tweeted my uh, interview on Elijah Schaefer and they're like, going to retweet this kid. Cause now everyone can see how dumb he is. It's like the reason they don't debate me is because they know that that would be the outcome, what just happened. You know, what you just saw was a rookie mistake. These are all con ink, you know, like I said, 30 under 30. And they just haven't learned yet what Shapiro and all these other guys know, which is you can't talk to someone far smarter than you. Like, <laughs> such so you can't debate Nick Fuentes. They didn't learn that one yet. So, and, and as a consequence, you know, they realize their real position in relation to me, which is that we're not, we're not allies, right? And, uh, you know, they also figured out what's really going on in America. Yeah, I love that guy. He's like, I'm a dissident like you. You're a dissident. What the hell are you talking about? Like, I'm, I'm on a federal no-fly list. I, no bank will process credit cards for me on my website. As you know, I had half of a million dollars seized from my checking account by the FBI. The list goes on and on and on. I'm banned from Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I'll probably be in this account before the end of the night or by tomorrow. I'm banned from TikTok. I'm banned from Spotify, PayPal, Stripe. And this ISI fellow, this fucking ISI fellow and his buddy from, from Newsmax, Newsmax, they're going to tell me that they're dissidents? I'm an editor. Hi, I'm an editor at Newsmax. I'm a dissident. You know, Newsmax, 
is not any different from Fox News. Okay, let me just tell you that. I know everybody says like, oh, OAN and Newsmax are uh, some great alternative to Fox News. They're not. They're the same. OAN, Newsmax, on the, the level of management, they are no different than Fox. They, it, honestly, on some level, it's worse because they don't have to be, but they are. So, I mean, the guy's an ISI fellow and the other guy's a whatever, and then the other mom fellow, and then the other guy's a uh, AM First Policy Institute, whatever. And then the other guy is uh, Yoram Hazoni's son. So, yeah, it's just a room full of dissidents. It's a space just chalked, chalked, packed to the brim with dissenting voices, dissident, insurgent types, right? Real, real rebels, please. But this is what we're up against. And you see, you know, I've been saying it basically since AFPAC too. I'm like, be cautious, be cautious, okay? Cuidado, because the, the, you've got these kinds of people that come around and they say, hi, we agree on 90% of the issues. And like the 10% of the issues are kind of like, apparently the most important and the biggest ones, right? Because <laughs> you get all these like, you know, Josh Hawley, Ron DeSantis, Tucker Stans, who, you know, then they like, quote unquote, they quote, like Trump. And then they go on and they say, Trump wasn't racist. And we, we need to transmit Anglo values to Mexicans and blacks. That's how we're going to become president by 2050. It's like, what planet are you from? And by the way, literally, how is that different from the old Republican Party? Like, did I not just say that like last week? Did I not say on my show on Monday, which was on Telegram, I said it's the same establishment <clears throat> in new clothes, same ideas, same people, but different costume. And what do we hear? We heard about uh, how America is an idea and we need to believe in a propositional nation, you know, that America is about. Uh, one day we're all going to come together and life, liberty and, you know, Anglo values, apparently, that can be adopted and assimilated into by anybody. And we're hearing these arguments about natural conservatives and pandering to minority voters to enlarge a conservative coalition. Literally, how is that different from everything that came before Donald Trump? What is the meaningful difference between that and like every other neocon? Every other, you know, Mitt Romney, John McCain, George Bush, how is it different? But there, but do you see how they try to take Trump and assimilate him into their bullshit? And they say, no, Trump believed in that too. It's like, no, he didn't. Absolutely, he did not. You know, when Trump got in and it was ISIS and BLM and all that, he, you know, he was not talking about Anglo values being transmissible. He was talking about white identity. When he said the forgotten men and women, who do you think he was talking about? When he said, I am your voice, who is he talking about? Uh, do, do the, are the black people forgotten? Have you forgotten about black people for five seconds at any point in your entire life? I think not. You know, I don't think anybody can make the case that blacks are forgotten. You know, if anything, it would be nice to forget <laughs> for, for, for a few seconds, wouldn't it be? between the BLM and the my life matters, black bodies, this and whatever, please. They are not the forgotten men and women and neither are the Hispanics and neither are any of these minorities that are beneficiaries of affirmative action and their own ethnic identity politics and, and, all, and pandering from every institution and every other conceivable benefit in an apartheid society. Who are the forgotten men and women of America? I had to just say in one word, be Christians? No, not quite. Would it be conservatives? Mm, it's closer, but not quite there. It certainly wouldn't be any other. It wouldn't be women. <laughs> women are not forget. They will make sure you don't forget them because they just don't. They just keep talking. Forgotten men people. Now he didn't. I'm not saying that that's what he meant. I'm not saying that like he he in the back of his head said, I mean, but I'm going to say it's like he didn't need to consciously know that that like i said it was implicit it was this is proto white identity when people here make america great again forgotten men and women everybody knows what that means you know on some subconscious level it's not a dog whistle because it's not intentional you know trump isn't doing that intentionally because he's secretly uh you know white identity activist it's just that like you know everybody kind of picks up on this stuff and you can't talk about it explicitly because of political correctness, but that's what these things are, are sort of like psychic workarounds for how we can communicate these ideas, even against the, the sort of internalized 
political correctness, the, the self-censorship that occurs. Like that's what CRT is all about. We have to call it critical race theory because we can't call it anti-white because what would that make us, pro-white? And what would that make the non-white people in media or anywhere else, racist? Well, that, I mean, this, this destroys the whole sort of created idea of race in America. So we have to come up with, well, it's critical race theory and the, the victims are both black and white. You know, because blacks are treated as as victims, and that that makes them victims of the policy. So, um, anyway, all of this is very um, simple and plain. But you know, these are these are intellectuals we're talking about. So they uniquely are able to evade. This is a Thomas Sowell quote. I'm paraphrasing. They can evade and ignore the real truth here because they're too damn smart. So anyway, so yeah, those were, uh, I don't even know their names. These are just random DC apparatchiks, but I just want you to know that's, that's like everybody in DC. Okay. When you think like, listen, I, I don't know if I should even say this, but like this, this new like thing that is going on, which is hard to even describe, I guess you could say it's sort of people trying to capitalize on Trump's legacy. They're all like this. Okay. The America First Policy Institute, America First. That Javon guy, that retard, he's in the AF policy. He worked in the Trump administration. That's who's shaping the future of conservatism in the right wing. You know, and if that doesn't tell you what's up, I don't know what does. He was one of the worst hires in the Trump administration. And I know that because people in the White House told me that by name. Somebody texted me and said, hey, Look at look at the new hire at AF Policy Institute, Javon Price, the worst token hire in the White House, and told me a little bit about his background. OK, so it's like, in other words, all the reasons why Trumpism was maybe aborted in some sense, those people are now going apparently to create his uh, they're, they're going to be his successors. They're going to be the inheritors of his legacy and apparently preserve it. Right. Subtract the bad parts and keep the good parts. Trumpism without Trump. That's what this is. And the people that are behind DeSantis are like this. And the Tucker fanboys are like this. And I love Tucker, but that's just true. And, uh, you know, there's there's a contingent of people in D.C. that are based, or were in D.C. There's a contingent of people that are still in this that are based, but most of them are like that. They don't get it. They don't get the Jewish influence thing. They don't get the race thing. They don't get the black or the white thing. They don't get it. They're not based. They're not like us. Don't be confused. But they all stay based. You know, they all sound like us now. They all emulate our memes. They all emulate our style. But they're not us. You know, these are interlopers. These are D.C. carpetbaggers. Okay? D.C. is a foreign nation, and that's where they're from. Okay? That is where they reside. Honestly, that's where they belong. Um, but like, you know, in other words, like go away, <laughs> not, not like they belong in power, like, like fuck off more like anyway. So yeah, that was a pretty, pretty good illustration. I think that space was very, uh, sort of instructive about what we're up against. As you got your Mazzoni son, Newsmax, ISI, you know, Claremont, AF Policy Institute, gangs all here. These are the people shaping the future. This is who's going to be working in the DeSantis administration. Guys who think we just haven't reached out hard enough to black voters. Guys who think that we're going to have a Republican president, that that'll be viable in this century because we make Anglo ideals appealing to Mexicans. That, 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 that is who is the next generation of think tank and, uh, you know, nonprofit NGO apparatchiks in the constellation of conservative organizations that comprise the Con Inc. movement, okay? And I hope that inspires a lot of confidence in you. It's very white-pilling, right? This is why we need the Groypers. This is why we still need them. You know, and people say, why do we need the Groypers? Charlie Kirk is based. Matt Walsh is based. What about this and that? Like, no, no they're not. <laughs> no, they're not. They don't get it. They are adopting the talking points but they don't get it. They're adopting the talking points to trick you and it's working. But you heard that space. Are we on the same page Agree on things? You know, they kept telling me how much they agree with me on, but all these sort of smarmy 
condescending, dishonest question. So you think excluding all non-white people and centering politics around white power is a good idea? No, jackass. I said that white people develop a racial consciousness and the GOP because its entire constituency is comprised of white people should probably pay attention to that. That's what I've said, dipshit. Girl voice, fake Italian race trader. Italian American talking about the transmissibility of Anglo values. But you know what? I will never have Anglo values transmitted to me, okay? I don't believe in democracy. I don't believe in liberalism. I don't show up on time. And I'm not eating your fucking green bean casserole, okay? I'm Italian. I believe in a Caesar. I believe in a Pope. That's me. That's who I am. That's my identity. So, you know, that... uh, that guy can blow it out his ass. Anglo-American values. Like what? Protestantism? That's a good one. That's a good one. That's a great one. No offense to our Protestants in here. We love, we love Christians. But it's like, seriously, the, the guy's an Italian. Maybe He's like, our religion precludes us from believing in race essentialism. Oh, really? Tell that to the Crusaders, moron, right? For crying out loud. Tell that to the Catechism for that matter. The catechism talks about immigrants. So, you know, that guy sucked. The other guy wasn't so bad. Funny how they both smacked down the black guy. That was tech. You know what sucked, though? They didn't see that it was funny because he was black. That's that's how you know they suck. Because they thought it was funny because he was making a dumb argument. It's like, no, it's funny because he was black. That's why it was funny. It was funny because he came like a typical prototypical, you know, black complainer comes in and just gets blasted. That's it's funny because of what it is. But they thought it was funny because it was like, you know, uh, triggered, libtard, annihilated. You know what I'm saying? Like that just shows how much they suck because they don't think it's funny. And if I if I said it was funny because he was black, they would call me racist. (laughs) So there you go. Yeah, you know. People just don't get it, man. Where are all the base people? Wake up, people. Wake up. Am I literally the only one that's so autistic and so uh, misanthropic and so, so, you know, on the outside? Am I really the only one that can break the conditioning? Because sometimes it feels like that. Sometimes it feels like I'm the only one that is truly outside the matrix. Because everybody else, they just have some kind of bone in their body where they feel like this, this, uh, like they have to conform, absolutely have to conform to, uh, on some level, the liberal, feminist, anti-white, egalitarian consensus. And I just don't feel that, you know? <sighs> yeah, that was lame. No, it was fun. It was fun. It was a good space. I enjoyed, um, you know, just total dominance. I mean, that's a thing. Like, I'm a perfect example of, you know, what happens when the best guy goes against the system? You know, what happens when your best, the most talented guy, the best guy in the world of what he does, what happens when he goes on the enemy team, you know, and becomes, that's me. Okay. That's what I'm about. Cause I'm in there with like these, you know, bright young minds and I'm sure they're getting all these like prestigious awards and fellowships and, you know, First you get your bachelor's, then you get your master's, then you get your master's, you know, like that, these, all these, whoa, very, wow, look at all these certificates, and oh my gosh, you're so awesome. And I come in there and just dominate. I come in, and I command the room with my voice. I come in, I talk, everybody listens. And you know what? And I got something to say. And everybody just can't even, they try, but they can't even argue with it. And, and they're not charismatic either. That's the other thing, too. So it's just no contest. That's why they have to keep me out. Because if I, if I wasn't so gate-kept, like, we would be, man. I mean, we're going to be, but we would, so much sooner, we would be just eating. The sh- and everyone knows that. But that's me. I'm like, uh, I'm like Jack Black in Gilligan's Island. Or what was that? Gulliver's Travels. <laughs> like... I like Jack Black and Gulliver's Travels. Remember when all those little people pinned him down on that island? That's me. 
You know, I'm like King Kong in that other Jack Black movie, King Kong. Uh, you know, I'm just a just great ape, shackled but waiting to be freed with this like savagery, this primal beast like. <clears throat> anyway, so yeah, it was brutality, pure brutality. Let's bring let's bring some people in here and let's uh, talk a little bit. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it on this space. Who wants to talk? Please request to join if you want to get in on this. If you want to get in on this. If you want to get down on these hairy balls. <laughs> that's, a chill. That's, that's me when I go in there. I'm like, anyway, that was inappropriate. That was inappropriate, but it's true. Okay, let's bring in uh, Gabe. Gabe's car. Hey, hey. We'll bring in media rights, and we'll bring in mm, optics respector, yeah, and we'll bring in, um, who else should I bring in? Anybody? Classical theist. He's not requesting. Uh, maybe Jack, is he requesting? No. You can see who's requesting and who isn't. Uh, let me scroll down. Jack, yeah, he's requesting. Oh, Jack Hadfield. Get him in here. It's a little late for him. It's a little past his bedtime. Doesn't he keep America? Yeah, it's uh, hours, please? it's, uh, it's uh, almost 5 a.m., so I should probably be speaking, Hello. But... <laughs> hello, old friend. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. How are you hello, doing? Honey. Yeah, not too bad. Okay. I, was about to, I was about to head to bed, and then I saw... <laughs> couple of group chats popping off about uh, about the previous space and i was like oh, okay i'm gonna have to get in here and i'm very glad i stayed up because that was very entertaining yeah space was ridiculous man There's people that guy you you this italian from west philadelphia is actually gonna go out there and say that the his neighbors that are italian aren't racist you know yeah philadelphia is not racist philadelphia like, okay. italians are not racist the guys that were around the uh christopher columbus statue with like bats <laughs> yeah you know? and then the jewish guy was arguing that boston's not racist it's like okay so you're just not serious you're just yeah. not taking this seriously well he's what he's saying is like he's going over the of the country and and going to all these political events and these people are like, oh, well, they're not racist. You know, obviously, in that context, everyone knows what's up. They're smart to know the game that they're playing. They're not laid back. They're not, you know, unmasked. They're they're in the middle of a political rally playing the GOP game. Everyone knows what's up. Are people really this stupid, or are they being obtuse? They're just stupid, dude. Because I don't think they have a bad agenda, but they're just they just don't get it. You know, you either get it or you don't, and it's just that simple. They don't get it because, um, you know, I don't think any of them are like, we're going to put down white identity for, like, you know, any reason other than they don't just don't really know what's going on. I guess when you are in, like, the Heritage Foundation or the Trump administration or one of these think tanks for long enough, you really do start believing your own bullshit, and that's the most dangerous thing out there It's like – Nothing but D.C., nothing but these conversations that happen in D.C. really exist to these people. And it, it doesn't really matter to them, like, even any real success as long as they get their cushy little position with their cushy little title. And their company, yeah. like, their apartment in D.C. on K Street. Yeah, I mean, I think it's hard to, I think when they were arguing that, you know, Josh Hawley and, you know, J.D. Vance or whatever are threats to the establishment, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's totally, it's, it's, it's a totally moronic take, you know, uh, like, like, again, just because Charlie Kirk, you know, talks about, you know, immigration moratorium and something that does that. Obviously, it's good. But that doesn't mean he's not sort of party establishment or really on the fringes of it, you know, because all, again, all these people, they're all they have a ton of money. They're getting funded again by establishment think tanks, even if they're you know more to the right than 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 most of politics but it's still within the frames the fringes of the establishment well and yeah. it's knowing which way the wind blows with most of these people of course they just got permission to do this and notice that they'll talk about some aspects of what nick talks about in the 
larger dissident right talk about, but they won't touch that one little pesky issue that that, uh, you know, their handlers know as a third rail. So. Yeah, that was that was very enjoyable, but that's uh, that Luca guy are that Luca guy, honestly, like he totally agreed with you. It's just that he could not handle he, he was in real time one of your like uh <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. slap down and then immediately comes like your greatest hater like, <laughs> that's what happened in real time he, that's true is that got a big problem for me for the rest of my life <laughs> i just created an arch nemesis that guy is going to be sabotaging me until the day i die making fucking phone calls <laughs> It's going to be like Benny Blanco from the Bronx. You know, I'm just going to go somewhere. Hey, remember that space? <laughs> I mean, it's so space. funny, again, how at the end it finished off and being like, uh, you don't have sex, incel, incel. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There's your, well, that, and you know what's funny? What's funny about that is that is actually more true to form in the sense that, like I wore them down and they just showed who they really were, which is just girls. Like that's what DC, that's what intellectual life is. They are girls. And like that, that appeal, which when we strip it all away, it's something like, well, girls don't like you. It's like, yeah, I don't give a shit about girls liking me. I care about the truth. I'm a man. I care about, you know, things that matter, but this like female approval, social conformity thing. It's all bound up in that. It's in other words, it's like, you're saying a thing that isn't popular. You're not part of the the crowd or whatever. And like, so you're supposed to feel bad, bad about that. That's literally the appeal. And like, that, well, notice they even had that like mm-hmm. simpering little floozy cooing along with everything that they were saying in there. Yeah. You know? Well, what is she, what was her insightful contribution? She said something like America's diverse. Class is more relevant than race. I think was what she, well, said. And she said something even more asinine. She contributed. She, I love when people say obvious shit when they're like, well, America's a diverse country. It's like, oh, wow. Thanks a lot. That's really that's really helpful. Glad you're here. But um, welcome to the adults table. Yeah. <laughs> But I think, you know, there's a lot of people, again, it's surprising just how thick a lot of people are and just completely in sort of their own mentality. You know, like, you, you know, uh, when multiple people say, oh, you know, so you want to exclude people of other races then because you want to talk about white. Did it? That, when have you ever said that? Ever. You know, I don't think that's something that, you know, these people actually get. Yeah, it just kept turning into like, so what you're saying is, so what you're saying is... uh. Yeah, like like uh, like the Kathy Griffin, yeah. <laughs> Jordan Peterson. Yeah, exactly. That's thing. exactly what exactly it was. That. And um, you know, because what I was saying is really not even. It's honestly not even controversial. But you know, I guess the problem is like, you know, once you begin to get to the fundamental truth, the problem is that there's consequences for that. Like that's why from the outset I said, like race is real. And f- from that, we can extrapolate everything else. And so, like, we could say race is real, and then we could say, you know, tribalism is real. You're not getting rid of tribalism. You're not getting rid of race, which is reality. What's the consequence, then, of multiracialism? What's the consequence of the high frequency of exposure between the races, right? I mean, they're living together. They're living among each other. They're at the workplace, at the school, at the PTA, at the bus stops in the same apartments. What happens then when you get all these different kinds of people smushed together, what you get is conflict on the basis of what race like. So all of this proceeds from like a necessarily true fact, which is that race is real. And then, you know, to ride it back up, you know, if conflict is the consequence that it will express itself in politics in a racial way. And if it's if black people and Hispanics and Asians are doing that as minorities is sort of like alienated. Well, when whites are ready, they, too, will express the same thing. And like the and this is important because it's are the base of the GOP. So all this ideological talk and talk about Anglo values, even caring about those things is white. It's white people that care about those things. And you could talk about, you know, Trump won so many Hispanics or blacks, but they were fully 10 percent of the combined amount of people that voted for Trump in 16, that voted for, and like, think about what 16 represented. 
It was Trump versus Hillary. Hillary was the most corrupt, insane, at the time, the most liberal candidate that ever ran. She was running on gay and trans and stronger together. She's running on diversity. In other words, she's running on everything that we oppose. She's running on an explicitly revolutionary agenda versus Trump, who's running against arguably for the first time ever, something truly reactionary, something truly conservative, which is literally restore, restoration, make America great again. And it's like, where did people line up? Well, 90 percent of the the people that voted for Trump were white. So what does that tell you? You know, when they say, like, well, we could just cut that off the top and say that's about conservative values and this, it's like, well, who's voting for those conservative values? Who cares about our Anglo-American heritage? Oh, yeah. It's the people that voted for Trump. Well, who are the people that voted for Trump? Well, nine out of 10 of them were fucking white. And like, do you think that that's a coincidence? Certainly. Apparently, there's no causative in there at all. <laughs> well, race has nothing to do with what they believe or how they vote or what they value. It's just all totally random. And we're just really going to get half the blacks and Hispanics. And it's like, no, the Republican Party, if, if the values of the party and of conservatism are voted for by white people, then we have to start thinking about that relationship as we go forward in this multiracial future. And the other thing, too, is they keep talking about like there's this conflation of like what is with like how we should respond, which happens all the time. It started out as a debate about like, well, what will happen? Well, white identity. And then it turns into, well, but that's not a good strategy. It's like, well, it's not a strategy. It's like what is occurring? It's a pattern of human behavior. Um, you know, based on first principles, like that race is real. But then they turn it into, well, your electoral strategy of whites only. It's like, what are you talking about? That's another topic. And in any case, to get into that, they're thinking about like presidential elections in 50 years. How stupid can you be with the rate of change happening technologically and, and otherwise with the 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 chaos, the sort of the disruptiveness of the past five years? People think that like, People are thinking about how we're going to win uh, certain parts of the Hispanic vote in the presidential election 50 years. Like, how dumb are you? Like, the country is going to become a one party Democrat state run by, you know, the, the big tech and by the media and by, you know, all these other assorted parts of the American regime. The idea that, like, we got to be thinking about, hmm, how are we going to get Hispanics to identify as white or something? or like for the constitution or make it palatable to them so that we could still have the white house in 30 years. It's like, and, and that's just it. They kept saying, and this says it all. They kept saying like, what you're saying won't work in 2021. It's like, well, yeah, cause I'm not thinking in 2021. I'm thinking in 2030 and 2040. I'm thinking about where this is headed, which is kind of like how you have to think if you want to change the future, not the present. And anyway, what they're saying doesn't even work now. You know, this uh, this pandering to minorities. You know, how did that work? How did that work for Romney? How did that work for McCain? You know, Trumpism is what won in 2016 and was pandering to whites. So, you know, I don't it doesn't get simpler than that. But the retort is always something like, I don't know, all this bullshit. Well, but Hispanics voted half in Virginia for young. Who cares? You know, well, but Hispanics, they could be conservative, too. OK, really go to Los Angeles then if you really believe that. Ah. <sighs> So, if I could say something, this is Ian from Media hey. Right. Um, good job, Thanks. Nick. And uh, you're the only one really out there telling the truth. And all these other guys are political consultants. And basically, you're just paving, you're trailblazing the way for them to be able to say things they couldn't say without you, but they also won't give you any respect, which is just total hypocrisy. So, just keep it up. Just wanted to jump on and say that. Well, thanks. Yeah, it's, that's very true. And that is true. They are all political. And do you notice the first thing they said? I get this from D.C. people all the time. They're fucking scum. They always look down on yeah. me because I'm like, you know, because I don't have like a, a job that a billionaire pays me in some form. They're like, do you regret like fucking up your career? Do you regret that your career has a ceiling? And it's like, that's what these people think in terms of is like, you know, mommy's good boy who has a big political job. It's like, you probably make $40,000 a year. Okay. Number one, <laughs> but number two, you know, about your career, your career doing what being on your knees for billionaires, not being able to say what you really think, like carrying on this ridiculous charade, you work for the enemy, you know? And like that, that sort of like epitomizes who they are. That was the, that was the opening elbow, which I didn't, you know, I just sort of brushed it off, but 
that's such a derogatory thing. Do you regret like, you know, messing up your career, career doing what sucking dicks like you guys do, which is in some cases literally true, but I'm speaking figuratively. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it, I mean, it definitely is very true. I, I like, see, the thing is with a lot of sort of populist ink people, you know, or, 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 or sort of that idea, you know, really they're, they're, they're very, very close to, uh, you know, American politics overall. And, you know, you, you know, you'd sort of think that uh, there wouldn't be so much counter signaling going on, you know, like they could just be like talking about, you know, whatever it is they do without needing to, you know, push back so hard against AF. But the fact that they do is, you know, slightly strange. It's like, why, why would you be going after, you know, the closest people you can if you are, as they said, trying to build a movement or, you know, they're attacking you for not wanting to build things when they were doing, you know, again, excluding in, in the exact same manner. Yeah. Well, it's funny like the, the initial beef was they were saying Groypers aren't that influential. And then I like come on the space and it balloons to 800 people. And like, I'm just you know holding court over the whole thing. And now we have three times as many people in our space as they do in theirs, you know, so go figure. I know Luca and some of these people, and I like get like the pragmatism argument. Like sometimes like I kind of get that, but at the same time, like my policy, like my ideology, our ideology is not revolve around industrial policy you know i'm not we're not populists we're reactionaries and you know, sometimes we have to ask ourselves like what would pat buchanan do because no one shifted the overton window more than pat buchanan did his ideology his words and his books kind of formed the basis of what makes us a movement itself and i can already 100 percent tell you what side he would be on it would be yours um and it's not there is more it, our, this movement is more like than just economic policy or trying to appeal to people based on vague platitudes there's something real behind it and i just want to thank you because you kind of got you kind of got me into this thing back in 2018 2019 and uh you know this is kind of my view well thank you man i appreciate you saying that and you're right i mean that that's very it's a very succinct way of putting it you know when they talk about industrial policies like the perfect that's like the perfect thing that they could say because it's like a meaningless phrase I mean, we know what it means. It means manufacturing to come back through a combination of trade and you know, other policies. But it's like it's something that's just so devoid of content. And that's just it. Like when you see people storming the Capitol or the Trump revolution, it's like, did it happen because of industrial policy? Did it happen because of, you know, some some think tank D.C. buzzword created by a focus group or think tanks? It's like, no. And uh, and you're right. Pappy Cannon is the one that wrote the, the roadmap for this. I would also say Sam Francis. Sam Francis is a, a, was a brilliant thinker, another paleocon. He was a friend of Pat Buchanan's. And, um, you know, he used to write for the Washington Times. This guy was a legend. And then he went to American Renaissance, which is Jared Taylor's conference. Jared Taylor's another legend. And Sam Francis goes there and talks about how it's like, you know, inseparable from race. Zinesh D'Souza, immigrant, writes this trash article, you know, uh, slandering him and taking his words out of context. Sam Francis loses his job, gets totally canceled. But it's like as time goes on, Sam Francis writes more and more about race. And it's like you look at these paleocons, Buchanan, Francis, Jared Taylor, Peter Brimelow, Jason Richwan, any of these any of these brilliant guys that wrote the guidebook for how we got here. They're not talking about industrial policy. They're not talking about fucking Anglo-American values. You know, they're they're talking about on a nationhood and like. This is kind of a tricky thing because some people are like, oh, well, you think only whites are American? It's like, no, but it's about what America is, which is, are we going to, I mean, America's transformed by demographics, but it's like, are we going to allow that to transform our conception of ourselves? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, America may be occupied by and full of aliens now and, and foreigners, but are we going to then accept this? and alienate ourselves from ourselves because of their presence and say, you know, yes, the America is now, you know, what Mexicans are white and, you know, blacks are conservative. Like, no, no. Paleo conservatism is about saying no, like nationhood runs deeper than, you know, assimilating and, and transmitting values and all this other nonsense. You know, it's actually when you were talking about the, uh, the pandering from the, establishment GOP it's kind of sad because these people who who do this pandering I'm sure some of them may care 
uh, about the demographic change within the United States, but they've kind of thrown in the towel and they've, and it kind of shows just that they've given up on the idea that like, you know, they're, the demographics are just going to change. So there's nothing that we can do. And in fact, you know, there's a lot that we could do. There's a lot that we can change and, and push for. Yeah, I agree. I think the, um, I think as well with the sort of like a lot of the focus on like industrial policy and stuff is I feel it's almost like the sort of um, like when you're somebody who is sort of high, high or on average, more than average IQ or whatever, you're, you focus on like numbers and policy and stats and like, uh, you know, ways to operate, you know, policy, the things that you would do, you know, once you once it is patriots in control, we're running the country, you know, would would we have our industrial policy set in this way? Would it be a good thing? Yes, definitely. But, you know, what is the purpose of that industrial policy? You know, why are we doing this? Well, it's it's, you know, to have a country, a functioning, successful nation and that desire to do so runs so much deeper than, you know, uh, just getting jobs back from Mexico, which is a practical thing in terms of how to make the country run correctly. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Well, industry and and, uh, and economics will improve so long as we, you know, hold the the core of our nation together and we don't let it collapse like like we're watching it happen right now. Hang on. Midwest Alex wants to jump in. He says he's got a uh, he's got a story about these guys yesterday. Hello, Midwest Alex, are you there? Hey, dude. Yeah, uh, I just wanted real quick because I, I was in their space like yesterday and they were it was the same kind of shtick where they were supposed to be talking about like the like the vaccination mandates and like the lockdowns and the mask mandates. And instead of talking about how, you know, those are bad and we can't accept them, they're saying, well, you know, natural. How does this relate with natural law? And that Hamar guy or whatever his name was, was going on. Well, you can't criticize the Australian mandates at all because you don't live in Australia. <laughs> And he was, and this guy doesn't even live in America. He says, I'm, I live in Israel and like, you know, I obeyed all the Israeli mandates and, you know, yeah, we have hotels and they're not great, but, you know, I, I trust that they're making it for the right decisions. <laughs> and I can't comment on Australia because I've never lived there. It's like, dude, you don't even live in the country. You don't even live in our country. Bro. And you're trying to tell us like how, how it's going over here. It's like, you don't leave it. That's your own son, yeah. right? Yeah, it is. Yeah incredible Which is hilarious because <laughs> Yoram Mazzoni is himself <laughs> the national conservatism conference and his son doesn't even live in the United States like yeah you're really invested in our future aren't you well he's guy? a dual citizen and the guy's like as we know hardcore Zionist Jewish and like how could anybody think that's acceptable like that just goes to show who these people really are like that the idea that you would that have just goes to show your deep anti-semitism yeah Nick. right yeah i'm a big anti well and then he's like you know, watch your show and you made six million literally six holocaust jokes i like that he said six silly <laughs> like how often knows is that no pun intended you made six there's no gematria uh there's no numerology involved <laughs> yeah there, right you made yeah. six holocaust jokes glad and I'm like, and then he goes, but I think they're funny, but not I am because you're an anti-Semite. Oh man, I think it was, I think it was more around four, like three or four, probably. I made like but... one joke. I mean, listen, that whole thing is like, I don't know if I should even get into that, but it's such a joke that white people are going to be bullied in America because of the Holocaust. Like that's just a fucking ridiculous. Like we should not accept this and. You know, a year ago or two years ago when the Groyper War happened, that was like part of the character assassination thing. But does anybody stop and think like why that should be allowed? Like why should this guy who doesn't even live here, guy in Israel, is going to try and silence me or invalidate what I'm saying as a fourth generation white American because of something that happened in Europe 80 years ago? Like this is, or you know, something that happened, definitely happened 80 years ago, like Americans should not allow this. And I said that in my speech at Dallas. It's like, who ca- honestly, who cares? There's a genocide happening against our people right now. And like, that's part of it. Silencing white voices on the basis of 
you know, the Holocaust or whatever. That's part of the ongoing genocide against our own people, believe it or not. Yeah, and I think it's funny that uh, Steve Cortez of, of New funny because the other guy t- earlier was from Newsmax talking smack. Steve Cortez slammed Lindsey Graham for saying more for Israel just a f- few weeks ago. Now he just got fired from Newsmax because supposedly the vaccine mandate, but they say they don't have a vaccine mandate. So that's kind of funny. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. Michelle Malkin said that they had a vaccine. Yeah, mandate. they do. They keep denying it, but they, I don't they obviously do. do. Yeah, it's some. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like on the uh, I, I, like on the topic of like dual citizenship as well. Yeah, I think um, obviously I'm you know still trying to make my way over to the states, but even if I get there, you know, have a you know, let's say ten years down the line, I you know get American citizenship. Well, one, you know, would I necessarily revoke my you know British one? Well, maybe not. And you know, would I? And even in doing that, would I sort of be? Uh, you know, would I ever be fully loyal only to America and completely remove all loyalty to the UK? Well, also probably not, because, you know, that's that's how I am. And moving to America, getting American citizenship, you know, that would never remove that part of me, which grew up and this is my culture and my family and everything. So, you know, again, pe- people that say, oh, you, you know, like that you can't question you know, dual loyalties, you know, be that, you know, Mexico, Israel, you know, the UK, you know, China, w- Russia, wherever else in the world. You know, it just doesn't make any logical sense. So, A, that's so true. You know, you're so British. You're, can I have some of your, can you yeah. give me some of your Anglo values, buddy? If you come over here, you should not <laughs> teach your children to speak English. My Italian great great grandparents <laughs> didn't teach their, uh, children to speak yeah. italian you got to assimilate into the culture yeah, I've, I've been Jack. transmitted they transmitted it to me i caught the anglo variant i need to return i'll make sure that I'll, I'll you know if, if, if i see them starting to spell color with a u you know i'll, I'll, I'll beat that out of them obviously Let's go. <laughs> yeah 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 this is all this is all good stuff you know so it's interesting can we go back to one of those things that lucas said about Oh, the whitest parts of the country are like the most against the Trump agenda. Like what he doesn't get is maybe the those parts of the country have not been in contact with how much the country has changed. Maybe by contrast, like they don't get what's going on in the rest of the country. They don't see it. It's not in their backyard. And as things start to shift, um, it's no accident that those parts of the country that are in most contact with demographic change are beginning to have this nascent sense of identity. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's, it's always been the case that like urban whites were more racist because they were in close proximity to the other groups. Like, you know, my father up in Chicago during the race riots in the sixties and seventies. And, um, you know, it was a segregated city and not, obviously Jim Crow segregation, but it's like, you know, whites couldn't walk down the street in the black neighborhoods and vice versa. And it it was, it was full of racial resentment and basically interracial violence, you know, because that's where the races were mixing together. And that's, that's where the exposure was happening, you know, from one to the other. And, and as a consequence, that's where the racial conflict was. And it's like, well, what happens when you take that and bring it to the whole country? But, um, you know, what was really funny was when he was trying to say that, like, Hispanic people are white. And, like, that is something that is just only only someone from a think tank could say that. No one in their lived experience would say that. Like, you know, I, I don't want to – I don't know if I want to get too specific, but someone I know works at, uh, well, let's just say, a government institution in a Mexican neighborhood here. And they – at a school. They say the Pledge of Allegiance in Spanish, okay, in Spanish. And they all eat their Takis, you know, Taki chips. And, you know, it's like it's like a completely different place. You know, my mom, as an example, she grew up in Little Italy in Chicago. She grew up in Melrose Park, which was at one point an Italian neighborhood. And now it's all Mexicans. And as a consequence, crime is up. It's dirtier. And this goes for this is Melrose Park. This is Cicero. This is like all over the city. In other words, like you can literally see the outward appearance of the buildings and the streets and all of it, the, the changing racial demographics. And they're going to try to make the case that it's like, it's him. 
And in, like I said, you could go to L.A. and go to a shopping mall and you can see that whites are a minority in Los Angeles because you'll be able to one or two hands how many white people you see sitting on a bench at the mall all day in L.A. And it's like when you see all these Hispanics and they're all speaking Spanish and they're all they got the you know, hundred kids in their strollers and doing their thing. It's like, do you feel like you're in a white country? Do you feel like you're in an assimilated? Oh, well, Italians became white and they adopted Anglo values. So will they. So have they. It's like what what person would argue that what person would argue that these cities are not like enclaves of a foreign country? And they're like, well, it's culture. It's like, dude, they're non-white immigrants. It, they're non-white immigrants reproducing their non-white native culture in America. Like, I don't understand how people don't see, obviously, what that is. The Mexican cartels have different territories within different neighborhoods of Los Angeles, man. I mean, come on. Come I mean, on. Lo- Los Angeles is clearly an example of what happens when Mediterranean values, you know, take over. Los Angeles. Angeles. Values. What's really crazy is all these people moving from California states like Idaho, and they know why they moved there, but they're too afraid to say it. They'll just say things like, oh, I love my gun rights. And they know it's because it's a majority white state, and they're too afraid to say it at, at a GOP meeting or, you know, all these boomy numery cons. It's like, just say it, you know. You know why you did it, say it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's just a lot. They're in denial is what it is. I mean, at the end of the day, I, it's something like basically cowardice, you know, because yeah, they, they know the consequences of, of what would happen to them if they were to like agree with me, right. if they were to believe these things. Like, I don't know that they're consciously saying like, well, I'm going to lie to keep my job. But subconsciously, that is happening. You know, because this is something that you're just not supposed to believe, but we all know it's true. And this is why, like, I think people like my show, because I'm not trying to sell you. I'm not a political consultant. I'm not campaigning to you. I'm not selling you anything. Like, I'm just telling you how it is. But these guys, like, and I said this earlier, they kept conflating, like, well, what what is the direction of the country versus, like, how we should care for that or how we should strategize. It's like they don't see a difference because they're so thoroughly involved in the system that, like, they're inseparable from it. They're advocates. What they say cannot be divorced from, like, their line of work, which is that they, like, they believe that they're going to get all these blacks and Hispanics to vote for the GOP and a GOP president's going to come to power and these pussies are going to work for that president. And so that like that colors everything that they say. That's why everything that they say is like, you know, this this insane denial stuff. It's because, you know, in some sense is bound up in their their future job prospects. That's, you know, like I said, they're trying to sell this strategy to people. The Steve Bannon thing where it's like we're going to convince Hispanics that they're working class like the whites or that they're kind of like whites. And then we're going to rule for 100 years and like pursuant to that. Like, I think they think that if they if they keep saying it, like maybe they'll speak it into existence or they'll, they'll further that cause by saying it. But these guys are advocates. They, they're completely uh, like blinded by their ideology and their advocacy. Yeah, yeah they- but uh, Nicker, brain flakes, brain flakes. <laughs> Do these dumbasses even have like actual morals? Because if they, you know, spoke out against, you know, what, what mommy tells them to say, they would get fired and they would lose money. So do they even have like actual values or, you know, what I, mean? I mean, they're really just like pawns of whoever pays them. So true. Yeah. It's, it's true. Not really. They're, they're DC people. They're only focused on like keeping up the appearance. Exactly. They want to be at it's, it's the DC bars with all the other politicals and their suits and their $40 yeah. drinks. And they want to get invited to like the Reagan ball or yeah. whatever it is. They're not interested in actually. And that is why, and and that's why they hate Brain Flakes so much because he (laughs) is in it. He's in it for real and he actually believes in it. Okay. And And look how they like quickly dismissed, uh, like, they just dismissed like the whole Dave Riley thing. Like, they're like, oh, that's a local thing. That doesn't matter. That's not DC. You know, that's not a federal position. But like, Dave Riley on a school board would do more good than any of those people will do in D.C. for however long they're there until they just can't afford it because they make like 20 grand, 40 grand a year (laughs) in D.C. and they just can't afford it. Like Dave Riley, as a school board member, is more effective than they could ever I mean, I mean, I'm going to say, just sort of jumping about about Dave Riley, when I was sort of 
you know, when I'd done some some reporting on his race, um, you know, that sort of got me targeted by, you know, a bunch of sort of lefty Antifa hackers. And Uh-oh. there was at one point, and it was like, that's the only time I sort of actually did feel a little spooked uh, in, you know, by a number of years in doing like this kind of journalism stuff, you know, but like they're going after me. Again, so people say, "Oh, this is not effective." Why? Why was I targeted for reporting on like this small race if it means nothing? Because you're white. <laughs> yeah, so <true>. um, <laughs> that's so true, though, about keeping up appearances, and th- that's honestly why they feel so threatened by the Groypers exactly. because the Groypers shit on all of that. You know, the Groypers come in and like. We're rowdy. Mm-hmm. We're, we're sort of like, it's like that, uh, I don't know. It's, it's like a lot of things, actually. It's like a lot of mm-hmm. movies. But we're like the sort of proverbial, sort of just like crass, rowdy, yeah. let the boys be boys. Like, we don't care about pomp and we don't care about convention. We're coming into the Trump hotel exactly. and just taking a big groiper dump in the middle of the floor. And, you know, Raheem Kassam is vomiting up his, you know, his $50 drink because it smells like shit because yeah. groipers just made so much of it in the uh-huh. lobby like that. And they hate us for that. We are going in there and just like we are fundamentalists earlier, dissident, yeah. anti-establishment. I mean, we're the real people of America. And, and they were trying to tell you, oh, th- th- that that's not what Trump is like at all. I'm like, oh, he, Trump's nothing like, what, what would they know about Trump? Trump came in there, like you said, and, and, and he's comfortable, you know, the wall, the rapist stuff. Trump is nothing like them. Trump says what he wants. Okay. So I don't know why they would know anything about Trump. Uh, they're just losers. So, yeah. Exactly well, right. Well, furthermore, in terms of energy and in terms of the role that he played, Trump was that. Trump uh-huh. was our role when he was in Manhattan. Exactly. He was the outsider. Everybody hated him. Everybody thought that he was lowbrow, that he was crass, that he was uh, not refined, didn't use the right language. He was new money, you know, all this stuff, a slumlord. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, do they really think that because their dads are on all these think tanks that that they're the real inheritors of the Trump administration? I mean, come on. Well, it's the same people that push economic politics only. Like, that's the main thing that matters, that are bound by the economics of what they do. They can't say the truth because they'll lose their job, they'll lose their income, they'll lose their status based on economics. It's It's like the same game that the Republicans have been doing for like 20 years, man, with the, oh, just... You know, go towards economics, stay away from, uh, you know, third rail social issues, stay away from it. You know, let's just focus on economics with a new economic policy. It's nothing different than what we've been fed by these motherfuckers for like based on employment and not reality. If you're you're really going to be in this to make a change, you've got to know that it's a blood sport and it's not a regular job where you're going to have a steady income and it's not going to be threatened if you take a chance and say some truth. Hang on, that, you know, that black it, it, guy, it, it must that really, black guy from the other spaces them. here. The, uh, What's up, dude? You guys remember, you guys remember the moment when, uh, when Trump was, uh, was on stage debating Hillary? I think it was Hillary and he called out uh, the donors that were all sitting out there. Trump has yes. like yeah. an immense disdain for like these establishment conservatives, establishment uh, big money donors. So it's really, it's insane for uh, these people, even like on these spaces to have the idea that for some reason, Trump like encourages that type of behavior and he's their guy. It really makes no sense at all. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was an outsider, you know I mean? Like, and that that's kind of like a libel against the Trump admin that and, it, you know, like it's mm-hmm. so amazing the short memory that people have, because, you know, when Trump announced and when he was running uh, before the primary, like in the, the Fox News debate in August 15 and like all oh, the way through, that was the best. He was they hated him. They went harder mm-hmm. against him than they went against Clinton. I mean, do you remember they said, oh, he's not conservative. Oh, he's. His, he's got New York values and he's uh, divorced and he's he's in favor of universal yeah. health care. <clears throat> they hated Trump, one in D.C., everyone in the establishment. You know, people forget that, that before he became the president and then they all needed him for a job or an endorsement, whatever. 
but he was the ultimate outsider. And it was only then that they all put on the MAGA hat and they all said, oh, we're Trump supporters was, you know, once they were all sipping on drinks in the Trump hotel with their admin jobs or in these new think tanks and whatever. And that's the worst libel is after this, this five year period after the Trump admin, you know, what fell short largely because of staffing problems. Now they're going to say oh, Trump was one of us all along. Fuck you. Trump was never one of you. You know, and you're right. Exactly. Yeah, he came out there and said, you know, that's their donors and special interests out there. Like that was the most that was like a groundbreaking game. Such a moment. good moment. You know, Nick, it's just that's incredible. incredible yeah. I completely agree with you. I definitely think that a lot of the problems were people within the admin. I don't think anyone disagrees with that. But fundamentally, I think what you see now is a lot of folks like Luca, who I was my first time meeting that dude. He's got an asshole who mm-hmm. who likes to he, he's I think honestly the problem with DC and this is coming from someone who like I told you was in the admin and all this stuff you get a lot of people like that who try to misinterpret what the Trump administration was really about now you and I I think obviously have our differences and some shit but fundamentally I think you have a point which is that Trump came in and said fuck all this stuff we're rearranging this from top to bottom and you got people like Luca who got to DC and try to stop that and now want to take credit for all the progress when they weren't about that to begin with. I mean, we know that. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I mean, Trump came in to blow up D.C., not not literally, but figuratively. And all these D.C. people have okay. weaseled their way in and they weaseled their way in in the admin. And uh, now that the admin is done, they are trying to basically recollect what they lost in 16. And like that's yep. what cannot be allowed to happen. That's what I've been warning about now honestly, since the beginning of my show, but especially in the past year, it's this like this relapse, which is happening and is going to happen that you're going to get people buying back into the GOP. And honestly, Trump is a part of this, you know, Trump trying to help Kevin McCarthy get the majority or get the speakership. (sighs) Like, what are you fucking kidding me? And it's like, so Trump is supposed to turn like the, the outcome in 2022 of Trumpism is a Kevin McCarthy speakership. What are you kidding me? Do you think he like, support Kevin, though, dude? I feel like he's more no. concerned about just getting the numbers. I don't think he I don't, I, I'm not convinced oh, he support. Kevin. He? Well, I mean, he took a picture with him in Mar-a-Lago after he left office and he said in that statement that they wanted to get them the majority. I mean, I agree with you. I don't think he's in favor of the establishment, but. I mean, that's what they're working towards. If if the midterms were held today and Republicans won, Kevin McCarthy would be the speaker. So I know what you're saying, though. I get it. Do you it, see but... what I mean, though? Like, I feel like it's like he's working with Kevin because that's Kevin's in the spot right now. Like, personally, I I don't know. I'm, I'm not the biggest no, fan I know of Kevin McCarthy. Saying. But, you know, what I'm saying like it's like who else would he work with right now? To hey, Javon, not yeah, to I derail don't... this, man, but uh, were you private in the other space? Why'd you go private? <laughs> Yeah. Oh yeah, no, I've been private, bro. Um, I uh, I uh, I'm military now, so got to be. I don't want to get kicked out for being a nationalist or a populist. The military is crazy, bro. So you have to take Pussy. the vaccine, huh? So do you have to take the vaccine to be in the military? Uh, no, there's actually religious exemptions. They're not very easy to get, but I'm in. Yeah, no spike proteins in here. Yeah, they uh, they make it they make it hell to get the. So exemption. you got a religious exemption? Mm-hmm. That's awesome. I did yeah. do it for my job. That's uh that's a ridiculous process. It's you know what's wild about it though, dude? It's just like it's really screwing over our special forces, bro, cuz you know, they don't they they pretty much you know, do what the fuck they want to do. And a lot of them are like, I'd rather get the hell out than you know, stab myself with this. And they're like, "Okay, get out." So you got a lot of people from the special forces community just leaving. Not great. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I in regards to in regards to the the base of people, I think in the country, I don't think they want uh, that GOP establishment. I mean, despite Trump endorsing Kevin, I don't think that that like I think people see through that and they're like, okay, but we still want people like Trump. That we still want those those uh, those wrecking balls in Washington. I don't think they're 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 falling for that. I don't I don't know if that's that yeah, big of a threat. But the problem is that like. Here's here's the way I see it in 20. So you you might say like, yeah, well, he's doing what he has to because McCarthy's whatever. It's like, look at what they did to him in this last election. Like they betrayed him. He was that election was stolen from him. And McCarthy did nothing. McConnell did nothing. These people did nothing to to protect 
his rightful second term. And and like I said, now there's like this buy in again where it's like it's the same kind of logic we heard about the G- the Georgia Senate runoff. Well, you got to hold the line. Who, what are you going to vote for? A Democrat? What do you want? Democrat majority? It's like, yeah, we got to be willing to house down. And like Trump was like that in 16. Like, remember at the first debate, the Fox debate in August, he was like, I think it was like the first question they said, you know, quick show of hands. Uh, who is going to run third party if you don't win the nomination? And Trump raised his hand and they're like, and Chris Wallace is like, well, you you understand, Mr. Trump, that if you ran third party, you'd split the vote. And, and you know, Trump's like, yeah, I fully understand. And he said if he didn't win the nomination, <laughs> he would split the vote, run third party and give Clinton the presidency. People were outraged. They're like, you can't do that. You'd rather have Clinton president than you. And that was the kind of like hardball art of the deal shit that he was on years ago. Yeah. This like no compromise, no quarter, because the establishment is two sides of the same coin. And now you've got this kind of like, well, we got to support McCarthy because who else would it be? Well, we got to go for Leffler and Purdue because what we don't want Schumer to run the Senate. And it's like, but the, if you're playing the game, you're losing. If you're playing the game with the GOP, you're losing, you know, on, on some level, like engaging with them propping them up, giving more power to these people is never going to work. Like Liz Cheney got dumped and then her replacement is just as bad. Her replacement just voted. What's I don't even remember her name, but she just voted for that bill. that would give uh, gay and trans people civil rights. Like, so, yeah. you know, this idea that it's like, well, we have to. Do you think that if Trump runs again in 24, that he's not going to get cheated? And do you think that if he does get cheated, that Speaker McCarthy's going to fucking help him? Because he won't. You know, so Trump is just like giving something for nothing. And that was like the last five years, giving them the Obamacare repeal is the first business of Congress in 2017. And they fucked it all up. And Trump gave them the tax cut, the corporate tax cut. And they carried the midterms in 18. And it didn't. And, you know, Trump gave and gave and gave and got nothing in return. They, They didn't even when they controlled Congress, give them money for a border wall. They fought him in the omnibus spending bill in April 2018, gave him $1.6 billion for uh, fence in the, uh, the, the Rio Grande Valley region. Like that, that was, that was the, the so-called art of the deal after he became president. So like, that's what I mean to say when he's part of, part of it. And, you know, while he may be naive in that sense, like these people enthusiastically were going out for Leffler and Purdue. They were all down there in Georgia campaign. And, you know, they called people like me and Lynn Wood. Well, Lynn Wood's kind of crazy, but they said like, you know, I'm crazy or <laughs> stupid for saying people should abstain from voting. And these are the same people they are going to be out there for the fucking midterms saying vote red, vote for the GOP because of socialism and CRT and blah, blah, blah. And they're going to be out there for DeSantis. They're pro system. They are the system. They're part of it. And you don't win with the system. You know, system always wins. The whites, the goy, America, never going to win, you know. And so that's where Trump has to, like, revert to being a true revolutionary. He's got to run. He's got he's got to fill up his candidate with the right people. He's got to make McEntee, you know, the head of hiring and do it right the first time. Like, that's the way. Yeah, like um, McEntee, I, I remember... Uh, when I wrote something, I think it was either in June or July of last year, when McEntee was reappointed as like the head of staff. I think really, you know, Trump has to surround himself with sort of the people who are in D.C. now that were that are not D.C. animals that were brought in from the outside from the Trump campaign. John McEntee, I, I think there was there was a couple from the original. Is it Hope? Hope somebody I think was brought back at the same time. That McAtee, yeah, McAtee was, yeah, uh, and basically these people that were, you know, that were sort of solid Trump loyalists, solid, you know, base, you know, uh, pro America people, uh, and you know, have have that be, you know, uh, the base that surrounds him when hopefully, you know, he would get back into the White House. Um, I, I think I remember there was there was either a report or something in the in the New York, in the Atlantic or wherever recently where it's talking about how the White House was after the election. And yeah, I think there was there was some of some young, you know, like woman staffer, you know, in the like late twenties, basically screaming to like you know, to like uh, you know get the Pentagon and like arrest you know people for you know you know for not like going abroad and stuff. You know, it's kind of like that energy that needs to surround Trump once again, not the DC swamp creatures that so often infiltrated the uh, infiltrated his administration. 
Well, you look at like when when I ask, uh, you know, n- more normie GOP people that I know that are sort of you know here locally. When I ask them, you know, would you vote for Trump again in twenty twenty four? They're like, absolutely, if he runs for sure. They're like, okay, but would you run? Oh, I'm not. You know, I haven't really figured all that out yet. So people are still very motivated to vote for Trump or someone pretty much identical to what they saw in 2016. The problem is now we have this Trump who's, I don't know, I, don't, I wouldn't call it weaker, but like like Nick was saying, where, you know, you have uh, Trump sort of being easier when it comes to this art of the deal. He's, he's giving and he's not receiving anything in return. So I am I am kind of worried about the future. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, the, the whole America First movement, the Groypers, everything, it's all been very impactful into the mainstream. And it's I think it's scaring them. I think it's becoming very real for them at this point. Yes. Yeah. They hated the six because they were afraid. Like that's another red pill. The six. Uh, I don't know if I should say this for legal reasons, but. I'm going to anyway. The six was awesome. Bruh. It was fucking awesome. Love. And, uh, <laughs> and you want to know why? It's because that was the perfect end to the Trump administration. Like, how could it have ended any other way? Trump came in as a dissident, as an insurgent. You know, remember his inaugural speech when he raised his closed fist in the air? And yes. everybody said like, oh my gosh, that's like, you know. And he's talking about American carnage and he blasted Bush and Obama while they were sitting right there. And, you know, so he came in like a lion, like we're going to overturn D.C. Like people forget what a like earth shattering moment that that was his election, that that was even possible. People forget what it was like. And so for him to go out like cheated out of the election, not accepting the results, calling his supporters from around the country to travel to D.C. and rally on the White House lawn, the seat of executive power, and then to march to the Capitol and, you know, not just like picket impotently outside and say like, hey, hey, ho, ho, we need our right to vote. It was like, no, they're fucking scaling the walls. Like yeah. they were literally <laughs> scaling can the I just, walls. Like, can I just say when when that happened, uh, I was at work, so I I didn't even know what was going on, and I'm like leaving work. I'm in the car, and uh, my dad calls me, and he's like, "Are you seeing the news right now?" And I'm like, uh, "No, what's going on?" And he says, "It's crazy, blah blah blah." The capital, you know, he's telling me what's going on. My immediate reaction is I'm like pumping my fist in the car, like no hands on the wheel, freaking out, you know. And he's like, why are you so happy? <laughs> I was celebrating. Well, yeah, I'm like they're throwing cops off of the ri- of the thing. And like in and the the picture that they took where and they say like, wow, this is so reprehensible. But like, you know, that picture where it's like the Capitol's covered in tear gas and there's like fucking Trump flags draped over the steps and <laughs> yep. the Trump supporters yeah. just hang, literally hanging from like the rooftop. It was like, it couldn't end any other way other than the, the patriots, the forgotten men and women going to the Capitol and just like, you know, not, not taking it over in like a military sense, but sort of like, I'm talking about the protest going there. I'm not, you know, saying yeah. like there was an insurrection it didn't happen, but I mean, like, you know, the, the visual of that happening, it's like, it couldn't have been a better symbol. It couldn't have been a better finale because it summarized like what was going on. It's this antagonism between this city and these scumbags in it and the people of America and like demonstrated. It was like, it was sort of like a fourth anniversary reenactment of the inauguration, whereas like the people coming to DC and the DC creatures scattering like roaches. And you're right, like they're coming down so hard because that scared the shit out of them. Like 500,000 people coming to DC surrounding the Capitol, like that scares the shit out of them. It really does. And so that's why, you know, they're, they're pushing so hard because they realize that that's the power that Trump wielded. You know, he activated this movement, which was set against the system animated in like this cult of personality against the regime and so he was able to call upon them to assemble in the capital of america three times to challenge 
the results of the election. Like, and like that scared the shit out of them because they kept talking about accept the peaceful transition of power or whatever. Because like, you know, they didn't expect just like Chris Wallace didn't expect when he said, well, you're on third party. They didn't expect him to fucking dare them to push him out of office, like literally have to remove him because he got the results of the election. And like, so the six was was a really groundbreaking moment. Like the significance of it cannot be understated because, you know, w- what was bound up in all of that was, you know, never forget because they said like this election is not legit. And the elections are like the basis of how our government has sovereignty, you know, in like a philosophical way in a republic. The people have sovereignty through the social contract. They delegate authority to the government through representatives and their votes. So when you cast out on the process in this, it's saying like we reject the government's authority to rule. It's kind of like what's that saying? It's like a direct challenge to the authority, the sovereignty of the government. And like that Trump did that as a president and that 80 percent of Republicans believe that and like half a million people willing to go to D.C. to like challenge that such a huge deal and like when they say it was bigger than 9-11 in a sense for that reason it was because it was of more consequence in that way yeah i mean like, yeah, it, was something, is... it was something that was can i ask real. you the question yeah yeah what is your because i was trying to figure this out in the last chat the last space that we were in and like my like i'm trying to i'm trying to be open-minded because i think I, I i disagree with you guys on a lot of shit but i'm trying to see if there's any places that we do agree all right so like one of the things I'm trying to figure out is someone in the other chat who was, uh, I guess, a groper as well, was saying that the America First vision is based off of like white culture and all that stuff, right? And I'm like, okay, whatever. How do y'all think like people of color fit into that? Like, because I'm from what I'm hearing, you guys are saying not that like we should get like that they don't have a place in there, but that it's, but that is distinctly a white american conservative movement right it's like what how how do y'all see like black and brown folks in that movement or do you see them in the movement i guess the well question. it's no they're in the movement you know like black people watch my show and they come to my rallies and they support me and hispanics do too and asians do like the, the movement is full it's, it's 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 diverse but the thing that they all recognize is like they don't want to undermine the character of america like that it's it's really, it's not like, like America's always had a black minority, you know, since its founding, they were slaves at the time. So it's, you know, it's arguable if they should be counted as part of the population because they were considered, you know, not like people per se, you know, so, but, but they were there, they were on the land and they in fact are people. So, you know, they, there was a minority then and there's always been one. And, you know, there were um, Hispanics and Asians like in California or in Texas or whatever, But what we're really getting at is that it's not necessarily having a minority population. Most countries have a minority population, whether they speak a different language or they're different ethnicity or a different religion. You know, you could go from China to Russia to France. I mean, Spain, every country has these kinds of um, cleavages is is a word for it. The problem, though, is that what's happening now is that the, the very identity and character of the nation is being challenged. It's like it would be one thing if America was... Uh, 80% white and it like looked like a, you know, culturally characteristically white country and felt like one and the population's mostly white and we had minorities and we had, you know, some limited immigration, you know, like we did 50 years ago, 60 years ago. But the problem now is there's like this concerted attack on the demographics of America and the character and the identity of America. Like it's, it's not saying like, Hey, do people of color have a right to be here? It's like, we're going to burn the flag and we're going to replace it with one that's off white to reflect how impure it is because of its original sin uh, against blacks and people of color. And we have a new national anthem and we're going to do this, that and the other. And like even within the conservative movement, they say things America is about an idea. It's like, no, America is a nation of people. And I'll say like me, I don't really consider myself 100 percent white because I am partly Hispanic, but also like my ancestors came here 100 years ago guess what? America priests a hundred years ago. And so even me, even generation American, to some extent, I recognize that like th- this isn't my home in the same way that it is the home of the people who descend from the founding stock. And there's like some element of like respect 
that comes with that and, and uh, some element of deference. This like, you know, I'm here to attack the foundations of America. I didn't come here to like overturn the way things are. And like, th- that's, that's kind of how it is. It's like, you know, blacks and whites are different. Uh, Asians, Hispanics are different. And, um, you know, there, there are black Americans, African Americans and white Americans, and they're different and they express their culture differently and their communities are different. And like, that should be okay. But what's happened now is they want to exterminate white America and they want to remove white America from its position of primacy, basically. And and like, that's really the issue at hand. And so I, I don't think it's contradictory to say that blacks and Hispanics and Asians can support you know, an idea of America with a white identity, because I think like that's part of the appeal of America. I think like people would rather live in a white neighborhood or in a, a whiter city or, you know, place that looks characteristically European than these other places. And that's like because America's the fruit of European civilization. And it, it can't, I think, can be enjoyed by minorities. I don't even think it's an, it's an option one way or the other. It is. But, you know, minorities um, you know, for them to continue enjoying that and appreciating that they, they got to respect where these things come from. And like, that's, so I, that's a long winded yeah, no, answer, I, but it's a good question. You're making sense. I think, I think part of the struggle for me is that while you're saying that, you know, I do agree with you to some extent, I guess that like America is the fruit of whatever phrase you use. That was actually pretty well said, but I think the issue I have is that since blacks and Hispanics have been here, you know, just as long and they've contributed to it. I think that's what makes it distinctly American, right? Is that like you've got not only the, you know, uh, I guess the stewardship of the the white folk who got here and kind of led the way, but you have the, you know, complementary or, you know, whatever you want to call it, roles of minorities who've also helped chart this path forward, right? So like, don't you think that that's what makes it distinctly American? Is that it's, it's, I mean white is a part of it and i do agree with you that i think the left is um, it just wants all white people to feel guilt for just being white but you know i think at the same time too recognizing that black and hispanics have you know contributed to this american dream to americana is you know is, uh, i think that's a fair thing to say right like when you concur that blacks are just a much part of this experiment or whatever this this nation of people as much as anybody else um not necessarily. I don't know as much as anybody else, because I think it's it's not like whites led the way. It's like whites found, founded the country. They settled the country and mostly built the country. The It's not to say that other groups haven't contributed, but um, there's just no comparison. I mean, China is a Tibetan nation. Like what makes China is actually that they have Tibetans and Uyghurs and Mongolians. It's like, no, the Han Chinese are what we think of when we think of China. Right. Like but that, in, that's... right. But in this country though, like, right, you can say whites built it. And I don't want to get into the whole slavery talk. Cause I feel like that sometimes just goes off the rails, but you know what I mean? Like black folk in this country have essentially been a very, very key part to building like in what this way? nation. Well, like in what I mean, way? labor, essentially free labor for hundreds of years. Yeah, but like, you know, I hate to go because Richard Spencer said this, but it's like, yeah, I mean, they they may have, uh, you know, done the, the agriculture work or, you know, built. Some and this of country was mainly like agrarian for the for its early part of its history. Right. So like blacks have, were fundamental to the prosperity of this country it, at, at the at the bare minimum for the least for the first up to 1864 at the very least right, or 1860 or something like that. Yeah, well, and then all the wealth was destroyed then in the civil, you know, so that's kind of sets it back a little bit, their contribution. Fair. And in any case, the the economy is really besides the point, because we're, we're talking about the identity and the character. So yeah. it's like, you know, we could say that a lot of things contributed to America's prosperity, but it's like, what do we think of when we think of America? We think about, honestly, if you would ask someone around the world, maybe 20 years ago, they would say, you know, someone named Jack, someone white, you know, as a white guy who plays baseball and likes chewing gum and eats burgers and drives cars. Like, like they, you know what I mean? Like we're talking about identity. We're talking about culture, but it's also things like, it's not just consumption. It's like, you know, we think of Christianity and we think about the sort of pioneer spirit. And we think about, um, you know, that this was a, a colony and it was a settler nation. And like, so there's a lot that's bound up in that. And as far as the contribution to that from minorities, I don't know that it's there because 
you know, when we think about America, you know, you might think about America cities and you might think of like Americans, but to me, that's like separate. You know what I mean? Like when you think about black America, you think about like, you know, Muhammad Ali and hip hop and maybe rock and roll like Chuck Berry. And you might think about, you know, things like that, but it's like, it's not the same. It's distinct. And um, same goes for Hispanics. You think about a totally different kind of America. So, um, so I, I, and I would agree that there's some like shared American identity, like the confluence of those things creates a whole, but You know, again, the problem is like that, that white identity and really sort of like the primacy of that idea is under attack. And if if that if whites are diminishing as a percentage of the population, then you're going to get more America, more Hispanic America and kind of like the, the traditional America that we think of as being eradicated and destroyed, you know, in the future. In 100 years, 200 years, will there be any white Christian men playing baseball? Will there be any remaining descendants that that lived through the Civil War and World War II and landed at Plymouth Rock? Like, no. And so what you'll have is that this this will give birth to an alien nation, you know, something that's completely foreign to the founding fathers or people, you know, even 30 years ago. So that's the problem. We're not saying that, like, other people can't share in it or haven't played their part, but it's like... You know, it's it's about this recognition that America was uh, was made by Europeans, populated by Europeans. We keep it that way, you know, and um, and really it's in response to this concerted attack on all of that, you know, like and I use the example of China because it's like it's only America and European countries that are subject to this idea of like, well, America's for everybody. It's like when we think of China, we think about China people, which is like. You know, people with yellow skin and slanted eyes and fine black hair. I'm not trying to sound a particular way. These are the physical features we think of. We think of ethnic Han Chinese speaking Mandarin. Um, And if the idea that like China would one day be home to like Africans speaking Congolese, it's like, well, that wouldn't be China anymore. We want to protect that. Does that mean that like no Congolese people can live in China? No, but it's like we don't want to destroy the Chinese nation. So it's like that's helpful. We have more of a normative understanding of China than we do about our own country or, or other European countries. You know, you're really good at explaining stuff. I mean, I don't know if I agree with you hundred percent, but I think you make a lot of, I, I, your argument makes sense. I mean, I understand. Well, the thanks. Point. Yeah. Thanks. I'm glad, I'm glad, see, I'm glad we can come around because, you know, I was trolling those guys a little bit and I was giving them a hard time, but you know, at the end of the day, we're not, we're not who we're made out to be as uh, sickos or whatever, we're patriots. And, um, you know, so, yeah, I, I think there's a, it's good that we could find some common ground there. But uh, let me see. Do we have other speakers you want to jump on? It's been a while since we brought new people in. Yeah, well, well I'm going to drop out. It's like about 6 a.m. here. Oi! Try to get up at 10-ish, All right. so... Yeah, I'm headed out of here. Later. All right. Good night, Bye. fellas. Good night. See, see, you. see you, Jack. We'll bring in some new people, and we'll bring in some new, some fresh blood. So, um, who are we bringing in here, Nick? I'm just bringing in some randos. Uh, Let's bring in, uh, well, we got Kind Zoomer. We got Martin. I want to get Joel Davis in. And I want to get, um, who else? Oh, uh, this Miles guy actually DM'd me like five minutes ago or so that I saw to get in here. So, mm. hey, um, I just uh, was wanting to say I, I dropped in previous room, and uh, one thing that uh, I've I've seen here in Oklahoma that the establishment does not care. They they will damage anything and just blame it as collateral to keep things the same. Is we're at a point in our nation where we are sitting here in the trenches and the Democrats are throwing grenades and we're looking to these political consultants and the only thing they've been trained to do is trench fight. But none of them want to step outside of their trenches because it's too not status quo. And so we need to start crawling out of the trenches. And so I'm glad to, you know, glad to have jumped on the space and Thank you for, you know, your voice and doing just that. 
Well, thanks. That's well said. Like, I like the trench analogy because it's true. Like, they think that we're going to win this war by with these like clever little turns of phrase and like verbal tricks. Like, they really do believe we're going to trick people into voting for something better. It's like, no, no, you're not going to trick people. You're not going to, because like they come up with this stuff like, what if we called it CRT? What if we called it? you know, multiracial working class populism. What if we, it's like with the, what's going on is not sustainable. And eventually there has to be a confrontation. Eventually we have to stand up, tell the truth, articulate what we want, rally our people. You know, at some point we're going to have to marshal the resources to make a change. But the, like you said, there's just like this lack of boldness where this risk averseness where and, and it's not even like some people say, oh, well, we're just we're just biding our time. It's strategy. We're being incremental. And it's like, no, so for some, yes. But for a lot of these guys are just cowards. They don't want to step out of line of the status quo because they don't want to be kicked out of the parties. They don't want the Nick Fuentes treatment the, like I'm it's like an enigma to them. But none of them would want to be me because none of them would want to be, you know, glared at when they're walking through. CPAC or Trump Hotel, none of them would want to be um, exiled to some alternative streaming platform. None of them would want, you know, they want their prestigious fellowship. They want the respect of their peers and, and their colleagues and, and all of that. And, uh, and that's what's coming first, as opposed to, you know, people that are willing to get in there and fight and like, and I'm not one of these people out and be hasty and like, you know, run into cannon fire and, you know, blow yourself up. But it's like, at some point, you know, we're going to have to engage with the enemy. And you know what happens? Casualties. Like, that's what happens in a war. That's what happens in chess. You know, to fight the other side is that you're going you're gonna to have gains and losses. And, like, everybody's so afraid of, like, losing anything that they're never advancing. And they're never even getting in the battlefield. So they just hold the line, but they just pull it back all the time. They just keep retreating. So... That's a very apt analogy. Well, what I'd like to just comment on that is we're, the place we're at in America, in, uh, I'm first-generation American. My father fled Iran during the revolution. And it seems to me that I'm 32 years old, and so many people my age group have been able to, even older than me, have been able to live their life through the Reagan years, through the Clinton years, through the Bush years. And we didn't have to respond to a national draft. We didn't have to respond to a national disaster or, uh, you know, a national crisis until COVID came around. And, and all of these people my age and older are sitting around looking at each other like, where, where have we been? Why are all our liberties getting trampled? And there's this great American awakening. And Trump engaged that in 2016, you know, when uh, Hillary Clinton was running for office as, you know, uh, what I like to uh, comically call the uh, the political uh, novelization of uh, what, what is that um, book uh, where uh, Kathy Bates, uh, you know, trapped that guy. Uh, misery, misery is uh, because, you know, I mean she had bill clinton by the balls because this uh guy who you know kept cheating him i mean it, it's it's a comical game of misery in a political level and now she's wanting to run for president of the united states and vince foster certainly didn't shoot himself twice in the back of the head these people who want to be in charge who want to lead our nation is they're just going along to get along and it's all about power and you know that's not what our american founding was about it wasn't about power it was about unalienable rights that were given to us by god not by man and you know it, it's uh it's just so frustrating to see all of these people who are waking up and then you know, the establishment just want to categorize them as a slogan or a catchphrase how can we reach out to them better how about you just remind them that hey you're an American. Let, let, let's talk about America first. Yes, let's talk about America first, baby. America first. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, we, we got to get back to the, the man that started it all, Donald Trump. Like, everybody takes him for granted because it's been, because it's just been too much time, you know, because, uh, again, they have short memories, but it's like, None of these conversations would be happening. None of these events would have transpired 
without the, the moment of decision when a great man went down the escalator and joined the fray. You know, he didn't, he didn't throw his money behind a think tank. He didn't look at it like a chessboard. He was like a general joining like the front lines with his troops and saying charge. You know what I mean? Like that's the kind of guy he was. He is the realest nigga ever. Like he went down the escalator. He didn't need to do that. He's a billionaire celebrity who has more money than he knows what to do with. But he went down there and he said, yeah, I am going to literally this country and make it great again. And from that point on, an explosion happened and created everything that we see here. And people forget that, you know, everything that's happened and every, every splinter, every branch, you know, every permutation since then has been because of him making that bold decision. And so I'm so tired of all these pussies that are like, no, you can't do that. You can't say that. You're not playing it smart. You got to tell them this. You got to calm down. It's like it was one guy that said, you can't control me. I'm going to come where you live and I'm going to make this country great. And we got to get back to that attitude, that demeanor and and the message because the message was, and it's been so like, it's been a long time. So it's been twisted and turned, but the message was about excellence. It was about standards. It was about who we are. And it was about the current dynamic with us and the people that run the country. Like make America great again is such a powerful slogan. I was before, but it's like, this actually presents an alternative big idea to the left. You know, because like, like in a general sense, when we think about our our country, what's the struggle? What's the challenge? What's the direction? Where are we going? You know, at one point we had an idea of that, you know, the revolution was about independence and then it was about forging our nation. And then it was about settling, you know, a virgin land. And that, you know, so all these things sort of unfold and we get an idea of the direction and, and all this. And in the, in the 21st century, it's like, you know, where are we going? What are we doing here? What are we even really voting for? You know, like after we won the Cold War and defeated communism or whatever, it's like, what are we doing now? Presiding over the liberalization of America? You know, OK, then it's 9-11. What are we doing now? Like flying to Iraq to kill Arabs? Whatever. What are we doing in the 2010s? What's the goal? It's like, well, the left has a big idea. Their big idea is lame as it is, but they have one. It's like, well, we've got these social ills that we have to overcome. We've got these sort of global things going on, climate change, racism, equality. Like they've got a big idea. They've got a moral imperative. People are going out and making a moral decision when they vote to vote for this, like a struggle between right and wrong. They're voting for civil rights, for the, they're fighting for something. What did Republicans have before Trump? It was, they had nothing. It was like, you know, you summarize Mitt Romney's position. Like, what was it? Uh, like, not Obama, like prosperity, pro-growth, jobs. Like, that's lame. You know, they run for office and they're like, well, the economy's going to be better. It's like, who gives a shit? Like, the economy doesn't matter. Nothing matters. Well, Everyone's out the line again and again and again in the sand. It was always, you know, OK, we're going to take back. We're going to take back. We're going to give this. Is Donald Trump went down the escalator and said, you know what, if you get a, if you give a shit about something, that's OK. Well, and and he presented this idea of, you know, what, what is in there and make America great again? There's there's sort of like a few key concepts in here. It's, it might it might sound very simple and maybe this will sound simple, too. But there was this acknowledgement that America was once great, no longer is, but it can be made again. These are the three parts of, of MAGA, which people, you know, it might not seem evident at first. And maybe this seems like simple, but he says America was a great nation, had greatness. What does that mean? It means we were landing on the moon. We were discovering things. We were kicking ass. We're not. We lost our way. We're not a great, like, that's what make it again. What do you mean again? It isn't now. It once was, but now is not. Which presidents don't talk like that. You know, politicians don't talk like that. They don't say, but that's what Trump said. Amer he said the American dream is dead. And he said America's not great anymore. 
but there was like, and then there's this third part, which is, but if we set our minds to it, we can make it great again. We can be excellent. We can restore this country. And this provides an alternative big idea for our party, as opposed to like this lame conservatism that, that animates nobody, that excites nobody. This was like something that you could wake up and say, I'm going to participate in the restoration of America, something that's like all encompassing. It's not just about voting for a tax cut. It's like, I'm going to go out every day at my job, at my school to make America great again for excellence, for greatness, for our country. Like, so like, that's the message. It's, it's that style and it's that message. It's about big ideas. It's about boldness, brashness. And it, it's also, it was also about recognizing friends and enemies You know, there there was that in it, too. All the other conservatives were arguing about, like, Hillary Clinton and the Democrats want to do this. And Trump was like, these they're fucking all corrupt. He was like, that's their donors and special interests. They put up the money. It's who it is. We're trying to get the tickets. I'm talking about to the television audience. You couldn't get them. Like, he was talking about both sides, saying it's it's not us conservatives the voters and the politicians and the fucking think tank people against the all of that on the Democrat side. He's like, no, it's me, the leader of the people and the people against the regime, against, you know, this this two sides of the same coin, the power structure. And like that was revolutionary, too, because before conservatives were like, oh, Obama and these liberals and we just need, you know, Mitt Romney or whatever. Trump was like, no, no, it needs to be us, the people, and not in like a lame, like, you know, revolutionary founding thing. But it's like, no, the historic American nation against globalism, against a global elite, against a globalist elite, which hates America, which doesn't believe in nations at all as a concept, which thinks that we're going to have like a common market. And, uh, you know, we're all going to live in some kind of federated continental government or something. Yeah. Yeah. And so so it was not even just about the people versus government, like this lame shit. It was like, no, these the the roots, the the soil, the land, the people, the our forefathers, our ancestors against these interlopers, against, you know, these people representing the globe, against people that reject the very idea of identity in itself. And like so there was so much in the Trump revolution there. And it's bigger than like, well, he was he was pro tariff and anti-China, and pro-borderity. It's like, no, it's fucking bigger than that. You you know, intellectual, academic, DC apparatchik, it's bigger than that. And like, that's what people don't get. So we got to get back to those kinds of, the fundamental things to to really dissect Trumpism and get back to those things. Like, and like I said, it's important to acknowledge he started all of this because if we're going to go further, we got to figure out and reverse engineer how we got here, which is like, So I basically just laid it all out and it wasn't industrial policy. It wasn't reaching out to, you know, a new coalition of non-white voters. It was those things. So, yeah. So another job well done on my part. That was awesome. Just blew everybody's minds. You're welcome. You could take that. It's free. That's free. Okay. You're welcome. I'll tell you what. I'll DM you as I'm sure that the Republican Party out here, uh, my chairman, I'm the communications director for the OKGOP. We'd love to have you out here. But thanks for having me on. Hey, thanks for joining us. I appreciate you. Yeah, thanks. All right. Well, yeah, on that note, on that note, I don't think I'm going to top that. That was awesome. So, So, yeah, thanks, everyone. For joining me here i'm gonna remove our speakers but thanks to all of our thanks speakers for having for... Us. thanks for having me Thank on bro you. hey you're awesome man. thanks man thanks a lot fellas i appreciate you being here and thanks for participating but that's gonna do it for me here i hope someone was recording that okay i'm doing this for free this is off the dome all right you're we're witnessing greatness right here okay you're listening to mozart right now you are you are watching a master at work. So try to try to enjoy that a little. Try to appreciate that. Um, but I hope someone recorded that for posterity. But yeah, it's a pretty fun night, right? I mean, listen, we're we're back. Okay, hate to tell you, you know, journalists who are listening to this, we're fucking back. I mean, really, in a sense, we never left, but we are back. We're not going anywhere. 
everyone can feel it. The meme magic is back. And, you know, Elijah's show, well, we're on here on Twitter space, kicking ass. Where there's a groiper, there's a way. So, uh, so that's going to do it. Thanks for listening. Love you guys. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'm just going to be banned probably tonight. <laughs> so, so I'll be back with another account. But I'll be back. You haven't seen the last of me. This will probably be it for me because I just, you know, I can't help it. I go on to a medium and I just totally blow fucking minds and then they like discover me and ban me. You know what I mean? Like there's some people that can make an alt account and just quietly be there forever. But it's like, I can't do that. You know, too famous to sneak in like, you know. So, uh, yeah, so this is probably it for, for old brand flakes. <laughs> this is probably it for your pal, for your old pal brand flakes, brand flakes here. With this bold new taste. That's kind of how I feel lately. I feel like I have a bold new taste. So it's sort of fitting. But um, yeah, so thanks for listening. Take it easy, everybody. I'll be back. I'll have a new account. America first, cozy.tv slash Nick tomorrow at eight o'clock. Okay, good night. <laughs>